uh, report that you've given to us. So we're, uh, we're next, uh, uh, Justin, I think we're to you. And uh, I think you have some comments you wanted to share with us today on, on this subject of state audit enforcement and fiscal procedures training. So uh, Justin, I think that's you in the, and over there, okay, you're nodding. So go ahead, Justin. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Justin Chavis, uh, Public Funds Administrator with the Department of Audit. And I have with me uh, Rich Cummings. He's our state and local government audit manager. Um, he manages the program that uh, collects all of the uh, um, local government financial data, as well as um, conducting the audits of those uh, entities as well. Um, we don't have really have any, any uh, prepared comments I'm just here to answer any questions that the committee might have um, regarding audits or um, anything having to do with our audits. Okay, and well, you, you gave, we talked to you quite a bit last time, so we appreciate you being here as we kind of were mulling this around and and uh, and where we're at. I, if I can, Bill, just to give you uh, and anybody else that may be on the line that I don't see, what what we looking at is we're just looking at <clears throat> there's a, a, a particularly a lot of I mean, if we go out and look there's there's a billion dollars or more out in the special districts around the state and a couple things that come up one is sometimes and i know i, I ran into this as the county commissioner sometimes awfully hard to get those districts to have their audits and their reports their financial reports in on time which then impacts the ability to the county to submit to, to make their submissions so that's, you know, that's part of it. So one, a couple of things. One is, is we're kind of look at compliance both and also regarding just safeguarding. I mean, there's a billion dollars of taxpayer money out there uh, in these special districts. And we're just looking at how do we make sure we've got the transparency and the, and the proper custodianship and the safeguards in place uh, to both one, make sure that we're transparent in our reporting and, and usage of those funds. And also to make sure that there's at least uh, some nominal, you know, at least not nominal, but some appropriate protections in place to the extent possible with these special districts. And in some cases, counties, uh, but uh, special districts and, and other public entities that have a duty to, to report uh, and, and that are also audited uh, by the, the audit department. And, and a lot of them which are subject to the, uh, to the fiscal, uh, municipal, fisc municipal Fiscal Procedures Act. So, that's where we're at. So I think uh, we had uh, Mr. Chavez, and Mr. Cummings are there. Uh, we had, uh, I don't see Jeremiah on today yet. Are you, are you, are you sitting in for Mr. Jeremiah, Chairman. Bill? He's there. Mr. Chairman, I'm here. Oh, okay. Go ahead. There you are, Jeremiah. Go ahead, Jeremiah. I think you're next on the agenda. Great. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm Jeremiah Freeman here on behalf of the Wyoming County Commissioners Association. Uh, joining me, as uh, the chairman pointed out, is uh, Commissioner Bill Novotny, who uh, serves as chairman of the Johnson County Board of, of County Commissioners, as well as the WCCA's uh, treasurer uh, for this year. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, we were asked to uh, speak a little bit about uh, dissolution of uh, special districts in particular, although we can speak to other uh, issues as they come up. Uh, Carla, uh, Ms. Smith, uh, did talk about uh, one of the major uh, dissolution provisions that uh, county commissioners uh, do have uh, as uh, responsibility, uh, and that's the dissolution uh, based on uh, the uh, Department of Audit uh, and their findings or their recommendations uh, to county commissioners based on the failure uh, of uh, this, or, sorry, a, a special district uh, to comply with its reporting requirements. Uh, and that particular provision of state statute, it is a shall uh, that the act on a particular uh, uh, requests uh, uh, and then uh, start the process. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I wanted to provide just a little bit more context in terms of what the commissioner's powers are or perhaps are not, uh, and then 
uh, Commissioner Novani will get into um, some specifics about this particular topic uh, that uh, the uh, Special uh, District Task Force undertook a few years back uh, and some specific uh, experiences that they've had there at the local level. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, commissioners uh, derive some of their power uh, to uh, oversee special districts from their ability to uh, levy taxes. Uh, in most uh, cases, but not all, uh, special districts are required to uh, submit to the commissioners their budget. Uh, and from there, uh, the commissioners then have the ability to uh, set the mill assessment uh, for that uh, particular district as part of the uh, annual county taxes. Um, in some cases, commissioners have authority to levy less uh, than the amount uh, that is requested uh, by the special district, uh, including instances where the district principal act uh, is silent as to assessment, um, assuming that the action that the county board of commissioners take is not arbitrary. So certainly have to consider that. Uh, there are other cases uh, where the commissioners are required to assess the specific amount uh, that is put before them, and they have no discretion uh, over those uh, special districts. Uh, the LSO did a really good uh, report on that particular topic back in 2016, uh, and uh, it, it is available uh, through the LSO. And from that, uh, it appears that commissioners have the ability to uh, reduce the assessment amount for cemetery, fire protection, hospital, M, rural health care, senior citizen, solid waste, and weed and pet districts. Uh, the statutory language authorizing flood control and water conservancy districts um, limits the power of county commissioners. Uh, and there are certainly other uh, variations of the model that uh, do exist out there. Mr. Chairman, uh, in closing on my part of the remarks, uh, Special District uh, Elections Act, which is Wyoming Statute 2229401, uh, uh, outlines uh, the dissolution procedure uh, for county commissioners. Um, and dissolution of a district, and this is a may rather than the shall, as I pointed out earlier, uh, be initiated by county commissioners uh, in four circumstances. Um, the first is if the Board of County Commissioners receive a petition signed by at least 25% uh, of the voters owning at least 25% of the assessed valuation of property within uh, that particular district. Uh, the second is if uh, the commissioners receive a resolution of the district directors upon determination it is in the best interest of the inhabitants of the district. The third one is if uh, the commissioners determine the district has not elected district directors as required uh, by principal act. Uh, and there are, of course, as Ms. Smith pointed out, uh, procedures for commissioners to then appoint uh, individuals to those boards, and that has happened. Uh, I know that uh, that's happened in uh, Teton County on the not too uh, distant future or past um, for uh, at least the Raffer J uh, special district uh, up there. And then the fourth one is if commissioners determine the district is uninhabited and the commissioners also determine that dissolution is in the best interests of the counties. So those are really the limits on uh, commissioner power, which also uh, show that commissioners don't have unfettered power uh, when it comes to uh, dissolution of, of uh, special districts. So with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, if it uh, is acceptable, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Commissioner Novotny and then we'd be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you. Uh... Go ahead, Bill. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Uh, Senate President and, and members of the committee. Uh, as Jeremiah indicated, I'm Bill Novotny. Uh, I'm a Johnson County Commissioner, and I had the pleasure of being the key witness for the WCCA during the Special District Task Force. Uh, in 2016, uh, the legislature empowered 
uh, a, a select group of individuals to look at all aspects of special districts. Uh, at that time, we had grave concerns about operations in Johnson County. Uh, at that point, my special districts had over $32 million in uh, reserve accounts, um, some were on land buying sprees, uh, and, and really were not accountable to the voters. And so uh, some of the positive things that came out of that work were the requirement that special districts now have to have a reserve policy, uh, and also the fact that codified into a law was a practice that we had engaged in Johnson County for quite some time, and that is requiring all of our special districts to come in and have a budget hearing. Uh, if you've ever tried to decipher the budget form that they submit to the uh, Department of Audit, uh, it is really difficult for the average taxpayer, uh, let alone to try to go to the various budget hearings uh, at the various offices of the special districts. So through our budget process, we began uh, requiring them, uh, and we appreciated the legislatures taking the foresight to codify that into law and do that practice. Unfortunately, what didn't happen uh, was a bill that would have streamlined the process for when the time came for the dissolution of a district. And as Jeremiah indicated, um, the dissolution procedure is scattered throughout state statutes. Uh, a cemetery, for example, is in 2229-401 and under those situations that he indicated. Conservation district, for example, is in 1116-117. And to dissolve a conservation district, uh, you can only do that after five years and with the petition of 10 landowners in the district. Whereas a hospital district, for example, which is in 352-438, the only way to dissolve that district is by a vote of the directors. Uh, through heavy lobbying uh, over the issue, ultimately the committee uh, elected to not move that forward. Uh, and that was really one of the only recommendations that came out of that committee that was not eventually brought to the legislature uh, and, and passed into law. Uh, I can tell you from experience that we have actually denied a district their full requests for a mill. Uh, in 2016, we did not grant the full two mill request of our cemetery district. Uh, we opted to only give them a half mill, which covered the operating costs of that organization. Uh, you know, we as commissioners use every tool in the toolbox that we have uh, to be good fiscal stewards. Uh, we, spec we expect that of our special districts. Unfortunately, a lot of times, uh, if a constituent has a concern about the special district, they don't know where to go because they either don't know where the district office is, uh, the district doesn't hold regular office hours, or meets at irregular times. So they're usually, what they believe is their first line of defense is to go to their county commissioners. And really, where my interest in special districts, in my work with the special district task force began. And so, Mr. Chair, with that, that is the experience that I bring to you. And I'd be happy to answer any of the questions for your committee on uh, this previous process or thoughts going forward. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Novotny right now? Go ahead, Representative Gray. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Commissioner Novotny, so I had a couple questions here. I mean, I just wanna make sure, you know, a lot of moving parts are at this memo on a lot of different states and learn about the experience. So. And we got this last meeting where we where we went into different uh, special districts and what's happening there. So I just want to make sure, I mean, there are counties that are not in compliance with state statute, correct? Because we received testimony last time that there were multiple special districts not reporting and they were not dissolved. So I just want to make sure from a base case here, there are counties that are not in compliance with this, correct? Because it's a, it's a shout. Mr. Chairman? Go ahead, Bill. Uh, yes, Representative Gray. What I can tell you, and I did not participate in your previous meeting, the only time the commissioners are notified of a, a special district of any type of not being in compliance is when we receive a letter uh, from the Department of, of Audit that says which forms they have not uh, turned in. So from our experiences, we actually just got this letter last week. Uh, I think there were 15 districts of various types in my county that were missing some form of their paperwork with the Department of Audit. Uh, we in the county treasurer make every effort to contact them uh, and get them compliant with whatever the state statute is. But from my experience, we have never been notified by the Department of Audit that a district needed to be dissolved. Well, but 
Mr. Chairman, can I follow up? Yes, please follow up. Mr. Chairman, I, I believe, doesn't the statute say that the notification is that they haven't reported and then you go through the process and, and it's a shall. I mean, it, is, there a, um, is there another notification they're supposed to provide? I didn't recall that in the memo, but um, I guess we can ask the department of audit for that. So Mr. Chavez, or uh, do you have anything to add to that to help us? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll let Rich uh, detail the, the notifications and the timelines for those. Yeah, ahead, and, and, and Mr. Sh can I just ask really quickly? I mean, what I'm trying to, the, to understand here, I mean, what's actually going on? Is the Department of Audit supposed to send a letter on dissolution and that's not happening? Or are, are the counties just not complying with the state statute? I, I, I'm not talking about whether it's right or wrong. I just want to understand who's not following the state. What, what, where are the line of communications not happening here? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Gray, um, the Department of Audit sends out the notification um, on the specified um, deadline dates for all the entities that are not in compliance. Um, so we notify um, the, uh, the county um, and the, the district as well. Um, and so those letters go out um, every year on those deadlines. So that's been happening. Right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Gray, yes. Okay. So, so just following up on that. So if a district is, so you send out they're not a compliance. And then the second part of that is if a district is still not complied with the re recording, reporting requirement by the end of November, the department files a notice with the appropriate county commissions, county treasurer and the county clerk. So, so you have the first layer, they're not a compliance. Then you have the second notice that goes out that if, if by the end of November, they're still not in compliance, does that notice go out too, Jason? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes. And then, and then back to the counties, then the county commissioners are supposed to, are required, according to the memo, to re, are required to place a public notice in the newspaper of general circulation in the county and assess the special district with the cost of public notice and then the county is supposed to treasure, the county treasurer is supposed to withhold, must withhold, it says, any further distribution of money until the Department of Audit certifies the county treasurer that district is compliance with the reporting requirement. So is, does that happen? Do we know if that happens? Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, it does. We make those, those notifications um, and then uh, we'll get questions, for example, from um, county treasurers on um, whether or not uh, districts have come into compliance. All right. <clears throat> okay. So I just out of curiosity, is anybody aware of an instance where the county treasurer's actually withheld the tax distributions because of a non-compliance? Jeremiah, do you, have you ever heard of that in your experience as a, the, the WCCA executive director? They do withhold. Well, Mr. Chairman, obviously I've only been here for a little more than 18 months and, and so I've heard uh, of that particular instance and in that time uh, to Representatives Gray's <clears throat> question really, uh, it is a multi-step process and, and there are multiple elements of the shall uh, in terms of what the Department of Audit has to do, what the responsibilities are for, for the uh, entity to come into compliance and dates. So this year, uh, the, the timeline goes through the end of this year before uh, the responsibility for county commissioners then kicks in. So, and as we look at that, I mean, one of the, and then what happens is if by the end of the year, the special district is still not in compliance, the county commissioners by statute must seek dissolution of the special district. And I think that's exactly what Representative Gray's referring to uh, and then it goes through this thing of what the county board what the county board is supposed to do and so uh you know and i think that gets back to the representative gray's question is is are, is are, are, is 
we had heard that there are certain districts that are not in compliance that that should be dissolved according to this, but they haven't been. That was what we I thought we had heard at our last meeting. I think Senator James nodded his head. I think Chuck Gray, and that's what Representative Gray is talking about. And so we're just, I mean, we're trying to figure out is is the statute being complied with? If it's not being complied with, should it be complied with? I mean, we're not, we're trying to figure out if if there's something more that needs to happen to assure compliance or whether we need to change this so that compliance is different. If it's not being done, is there a different practice we ought to engage in? That's where we're trying to head with this. And so we're just trying to find out some information to help us know what we should do, if anything. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, go ahead, Mr. Commissioner. I, who I who was who was talking? I I saw Jeremiah. Jeremiah deferred, but I don't know. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Votney. Uh, Mr. Chairman, from our experience, that first letter that comes out from uh, the Department of Audit generally triggers our districts to get into compliance with whatever is missing. We have never gotten to the point where we had to dissolve a district. Uh, most of the time, the districts that run into compliance issues uh, and, and meeting the, the statute are uh, the small districts with no staff, uh, be it a, a small special improvement district that maybe uh, was set up to form an irrigation ditch uh, that still has some assessment that the county treasurer collects for them each year as, as they work to retire their debt. So, uh, you know, in, in my experience and certainly uh, I have a lot of conversations with other commissioners around the state. Uh, I'm not aware of them being in a position where they needed to begin the dissolution process, but but certainly I can only speak uh, for, for my county and the county I talked to. Uh, certainly if we were notified that we needed to begin the process of dissolution of district, absolutely we would do it. Okay. And that, that brings up a whole issue. I mean, in the event so you go to those things and usually you're right, it's, a, it's some kind of special district and, and it, it's interesting. So you have a special district, not that they would necessarily, but you get into this thing with the must, which is something that I was wondering about. So you get a special district. So they've got several million dollars in reserve account or they've got several million dollars of, or even several hundred thousand dollars of unpaid debt from their, improve, their improvement effort. And then they get dissolved. <clears throat> That means somebody, somebody is out of control of either somebody's getting, somebody's reneging on, on a significant amount of debt, or there's, you know, there's now there's even less accountability towards uh, reserve funds or other assets of the special districts. So, I mean, I supposedly the dissolution helps resolve some of that, but in the end, at the end of the day, does it leave us in a worse position than it is when we started? Jeremiah, do you want to take that one? Representative Crank. Mr. Chairman, I think it's... Hang on, Representative Crank. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, after the last meeting, I talked to a small local district in there, a small water user district uh, formed about 25 years ago, I think 15 hookups, uh, got a, a loan from the Water Development Commission, have since paid off the loan and whatnot. But there's basically been two guys that have done everything for the district to keep it going and I asked them, well, what if you got something back that said uh, the county commissioners was going to uh, dissolve you? And those two gentlemen were like, oh, that would be great. We could get somebody else to do this for us because they're tired and wore out on it. So I think part of the problem is they still want, those people still want water out there and they're doing all right with that. So are we um, tripping over the county issue to provide still, but we still want to provide services to those guys. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's exactly the point, Representative Crank. So, I right, so Mr. anyway, I, you know, I think Jeremiah, that, go ahead. Well, as, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think that uh, Representative Crank has is, is certainly hit it on the head that uh, these services are still required in a lot of instances. Uh, and, and so do county commissioners then become responsible for uh, the burden of providing that. And that's been one of the issues that commissioners have had all along uh, through this process is, is the, the burden that they might then assume uh, from 
you know, dissolution of a, a special district or even, frankly, the formation of a special district from the beginning. And, and you've seen uh, in my testimony over the course of the last 18 months that, you know, we, unless there are particular safeguards in place, commissioners aren't really all that excited about adding special uh, to uh, the statutory roles. And, and so uh, it is an important piece, but to, uh, I also wanted to just uh, speak to Representative Gray's uh, question, and I know Senator James' concern, uh, and my, uh, I'll be this, I'm not aware of any uh, counties that aren't following through with the responsibility for resolution from the Department of Audit. If that is, uh, in fact, the case, uh, that the Department of Audit has sent that to uh, a county commission and they're not responsive, I'd like to know that. I'll be happy to follow up on that and, and pursue ensuring that they're in statutory compliance. Uh, and that would be my offer back. Representative Gray. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ryman, you know, Mr. Chavez is a good example of the legislature working, I think, because my recollection is a couple districts that were not complying for three years, you know, and so, um, I mean, from the last meeting, it was a month and a half ago, but um trying to go back and pull up that list but, but we kind of pulled it together in another hour and a half sort of segment so i guess mr chavez you can weigh in here but my recollection is there were multiple that that had multi-year issues and i don't know the exact situation within those districts i know um that there's a lot but but yeah uh mr chairman go ahead mr chavez Representative Gray, uh, we do usually have um, by December, the end of December, um, you know, single digit um, special districts who are not in compliance that we do have to send letters out um, requiring the dissolution. Um, so I'd say probably on average half a dozen a year. Um, we um, attempt to make follow-up inquiries on those as to the status of dis dissolution. Um, sometimes we do get responses, other times we don't get any response when we're um, following up on whether or not that has happened. Um, but we can, we can definitely get to um, Jeremiah, the uh, list of um, districts that um, are non-compliant that we, that we haven't heard anything from. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Representative Gray. Yeah, I think that's great. And maybe we could have that, they, you could have that communication between meetings and Mr. Chairman, I'd ask if you'd consider bringing it back at, in the December one, and, and maybe we could take it district by district, understand what the situation is in each one, because I know a lot of these are very unique, and, and I do want to understand this, what, he, what is going on in each one. So, um, yeah. Um, and, and so, and, and I don't know that we're going to, you know, we're, we're right now we're just trying to collect some information um, because it seems to us that there's a couple of problems and, and we've, you know, we've outlined those. I, I can tell you that even, even again, referring back to uh, when I was a county commissioner, water and improvement, water and improvement sewer district um, has you know, said, you know, gosh, I think it was like $7 million in outstanding loans. Um, and you have nobody who wants to step up and operate or otherwise manage the sewer district. It's collecting significant amount of fees to, to both operate and retire the debt. And, uh, and nobody wants to step up and, and, uh, and be in charge. Uh, and, and in some cases, I don't blame them because it's a, I think it's a thankless job being a county commissioner or being a, a, a city councilman. I mean, try being a super, try being a special, a special district board member. Um, but uh, you know, it's uh, you know, there's we've got, I think we I think we're there's two things. There's not just two, but there's several things that we're I think we're trying to look at as this committee, and that is one is is the enforcement. You know, is is the enforcement appropriate? Does it need to be changed? Does it need? What do we need to do with it? Because at the end of the day, what we really want is we want we want accountability and 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 a tra and transparency. That's really what it's about. And and then also functioning functioning special districts. And uh, and so I think you know that's one of the things we're we're kind of looking at that. 
and and how do we how do we achieve better compliance and better transparency and better accountability? Um, and we're we're wrestling with that. Go ahead, Chairman Navani. Uh, Mr. Chairman, one of the things I think that the committee needs to consider, and, and this is something that actually uh, the Association of Conservation Districts were taking the lead on under Bobby Frank's uh, leadership. Unfortunately, she's retired from that position. And that's just general education of the statutory requirements of special district members. And uh, a lot of these people sign up for these positions really not with a great understanding of all of that, whether it's open meetings, uh, the budget proceedings that they have to follow, the reports that they have to follow. One of the things that we did in our county was actually we offer uh, every two years after the election put on by our county attorney uh, special district uh, education. Uh, and they get a crash course and everything from uh, what they are, are subject to, to how to run the meeting, keep the minutes, post the financials, uh, we make all of those financials available through our county webpage uh, for all of the districts that are uh, in existence in our county. So uh, if anything, uh, if the torch could be carried forward on the educational component uh, and the conservation districts do a phenomenal job of educating their trustees on all of these statutes that they're subject to, I think that's really how you uh, avoid having districts that are not in compliance. And, and we've talked a little bit about that. We had uh, some folks from the, uh, the what was it, Municipal or Town Treasurers Association a talk, and they've offered that. I know we've got the Auditor Racinus on. I know they're off, off, offering that. And for staff, uh, my recollection was from our last meeting, we, it was, we don't have it. It's not mandatory. We, we offer it, but I, my recollection was that it's not mandatory that we actually that that they actually have training is that do i remember that right abby mr chairman i believe yeah it's entities are required to provide it but you're not required to attend it <laughs> yeah we can lead a horse to water but we can't make him drink so yeah so i'm which, which i mean it goes right back to your your comment uh, you know and and that was one of the things that we we kind of looked at that. I think that was something in our dis earlier discussions or previous discussions with the folks at the Department of Auto was that, you know, if we could get better education, we could get better compliance. And I, I think that's probably true. The question is, you know, what, what do we do to, to try and help that happen? And with that, I think that's a that's probably uh Maybe at this point, why don't we go ahead and if there's, we've got, we have some other people that you know, and and maybe they can talk to us about some of this. I know uh, we've got, well, I think is is Miss Miss Freeman on the lines, Becky Freeman from the uh, uh, from the Wyoming Association, Waco, Waco. I don't, I see Dave, so I don't see her. I see uh, Trudy, is it Izell? the Treasure Association. So Edie, if you're on there, or as, so anyway, we've got, oh, we've got, uh, and so I think Edie's on there. Are you preparing for the, for Madam Auditor? So I've got, why don't we go ahead and ask, do I see Mrs. I don't see Mrs. Freeman. So let's go to Trudy, is it Ezell? I see. Okay, well, I, go ahead. What, what, what do you have to add to our discussion today? What are your thoughts? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When I was notified by the Department of Audit that, they, that I might be put on the agenda today, yes, in both aspects, I think it's awesome that the Department of Audit is willing to train the treasurers and they have set up trainings. Unfortunately, both our meetings were canceled or one in May and our uh, Waco meeting in September. So we are on schedule to do that at our next spring meeting and hopefully that doesn't get canceled. On the other side, as far as compliance with the special districts, I have a sample letter that we received from the Department of Audit on a special district. And yes, absolutely we received a letter and it tells us to hold their funds and we do. 
we do not send them their distribution check until we have heard from the Department of Audit that we can do so. Most of the time, it's maybe one, I think in my term, it's been two months that we've had to hold the check and then they become compliant and we are notified to go ahead and distribute those funds. The other part that we do in this office, we hold their funds if they are not current on their bond. As far as if they have a new treasure, we have to have the current bond on hand. And um, once again, this letter from the Department of Audit saying we can distribute their funds. So I spoke, I sent an email to all my treasurers and they agree as well. They would like to be part of the training procedure to these boards. We did it in the early term of my um, experience of being the county treasurer. I did it with the county clerk and we met with the boards, fire districts, and talked to them of how to do their budget, how to file their reports. And I spoke with them about how distribution works. And so I think this would be great if every county would, would go ahead and offer this type of training again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Trudy. And then, uh, and then, Madam Auditor, how are you today? Fantastic, Mr. Chairman. It's good to see everyone. Um, and, and Mr. Chairman, I, I don't really have anything to add or a specific presentation. We're mostly here for, for questions um, and just uh, uh, refreshing what went on last meeting. We are required by statute, uh, the state auditor and the state treasurer, we, we are required to offer these educational programs um, to political subdivisions. We do think that has been done at some point in the past, but not terribly recently. So, so we're trying to, we were um, totally gung-ho to get that going in 2020, and then all of the uh, conferences got canceled. So we're working through that, but we do plan to comply with that statute moving forward. As, uh, is your is your training different than the training that that Trudy's offering? That's different from the training for the municipal treasurers. I mean, do you know have we ever done a comparison of the of the forms of training and who's getting it and whether they're different or not? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if there's been a comparison done, I don't know about it. Um, that I mean, that's certainly something we could discuss. Uh, you know, we're, we're required to offer training to people whose, whose duties, um, you know, include certain parameters. Uh, so, and so I'm not sure I'm familiar with all the different kind of trainings that the county mm -hmm. offers those special districts. Uh, and so if we were going to, if we were going to mandate training, I mean, whose training would we mandate? I mean, we've got training at the Department of Audit. We've got training from the state auditor. We've got training from the municipal folks have their training we have, and maybe we do it all, but I mean, how do we, how do we, how do we sort down through this and figure out what training is needed and, 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 and what, what do we do with respect to compliance in that regard? Well, Mr. Chairman, I think getting, I mean, I guess just in my opinion, I think you hit the nail on the head when we have to get our arms around what, what entity is offering each, um, you know, each group of, of folks. Uh, and I think the other confusing thing that happens is um, clerks and treasurers and municipalities frequently confuse, with good reason too, they frequently confuse the Department of Audit and the State Auditor's Office as well to, to, muddy, to muddy the situation a little bit further. Senator James. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, how do you decide what type of accounting system to use for uh, what level of government? Like special districts, I know, would use a different accounting system than state government. And would counties use the same type of accounting system as state, or would they use a different type? Um, how does how does that work? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator James, um, that, that's a good question. And, and just, uh, just as a refresher, 
statute does allow the state auditor to designate a, a uniform accounting system for the state, not for any other entity. Um, and, and we use a very, you know, we're, we're a large behemoth complicated entity with lots of um, very, I mean, I don't have to preach to all of you how complicated the state's finances are. And we need a commensurate accounting system and that's what we have. Our accounting system would be um, entirely inappropriate for a smaller uh, town or, or county and particularly uh, a bad fit for, for special districts. And um, we actually, you know, trying to think outside the box, we actually have talked to the vendor of our large accounting system to see if they even had a product for smaller entities such as, um, you know, even, even a, a city or a town. And the bottom line is they don't. Their, mm -hmm. their, um, their smallest client, maybe Edie can remember, it's, it's like, a, it's a gigantic, city it's a city you know it's like a, a huge county that has more more people in it than the state of Wyoming um and I would I, I guess I'll use sort of a, a corny analogy it's almost like you're going shopping for medical services if you need a few stitches on your finger we don't send you to the the Mayo Clinic that would be a bad use of resources it would be too expensive to fix that problem and so I would I would say the same thing about, um, you know, the state's accounting system doesn't make a lot of sense, you know, for a very, very teeny special district with very simple ins and outs, you may not even need an accounting system, you know, putting your finances in Excel for certain entities may, may be appropriate. Follow up, Mr. Chairman. Sure, go ahead, Senator James. Well, I was, I was bringing that up for the training purposes, if all the entities had the appropriate and same accounting system, that would make the trainings a lot easier. And um, like the special districts had the same accounting system and that would make uh, commissioners job a lot easier for the training for uh, those meetings. and that make it a lot easier for the Department of Audits and and if the counties all had the same accounting system, that would just make everything more streamlined. Um, a stand, just a standardized system. Um, so yeah, that was just a idea for having something standardized for each level, something appropriate, but standardized. Mr. Chairman, may I make a quick follow-up? Sure. sure, go ahead. I mean, I, I can't disagree uh, with you, Senator James. I think that's absolutely true. Obviously, there's the endeavor of getting getting there, which is another conversation. But to, to Senator James's point, I think, I think the way that I would view our statutory obligation right now um, as, the, as the SAO would be to train uh, uh, the best to you know, to the best of our abilities on very basic accounting concepts and controls, uh, you know, se separation of duties, that, that sort of thing. Um, well, separation of duties is a bad example because in, in many of these entities, they're so small, you can't have it. But that would be, that would be what we would focus on is generalized um, accounting concepts and cash handling concepts that would be applicable to a hundred percent of the entities. All right, I mean what what state she's, what state statute simply requires now is that that it just be an accounting system that's that complies with generally accepted accounting principles. And so you know I, I you know I, you know one size it's hard to make one size fit all but I we've got I see that we've got and I missed him before. I think we've got David Frazier, who's the executive director of the uh, Wyoming Association of Municipalities. I see that he's on, he's on here. And I, I wondered if he had any thoughts he'd like to share with us. Mr. Frazier, are you there? I am here, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, you know, it's interesting that uh, that the discussion kind of 
you know, has kind of uh, now gone in the direction of the assignment that I was given. I was worried for a minute that I was in the wrong meeting, uh, but uh, just kidding about that. But uh, I was asked to talk a little bit about the training opportunities that the associate that uh, WAM provides to our members. And uh, I can give a really quick overview of that and then maybe address a couple of the specific things that came up here and then any other questions, if that works for you, Mr. Chairman. Please go ahead. So the uh, one, of, one of the very important pillars of our mission at the Wyoming Association of Municipalities is the training of our members. And of course that training, it, you know, what we're gonna discuss today is gonna be the financial training we provide, but of course we provide training, you know, in everything from uh, open meetings and open records to how to run a meeting, to uh, uh, how to, uh, you know, how blockchain works. Uh, we, we cover a lot, of, a lot of ground. Specifically, we have, um, really we have four, uh, five, I would say, uh, opportunities annually uh, for our members to receive training, uh, which includes which includes financial training, and I'll mention some of the specific financial trainings in just a moment. But uh, specifically, we have two annual conferences. We have one in the summer, usually in June, and that's uh, and that's uh, our longest conference, several days long, and that takes place. the The communities in the state take turns hosting that, so we have that somewhere different in the state every June. Additionally, we have a second conference, which we call our winter conference which takes place during the legislative session. <clears throat> and there's a little more focus there on what's going on at the legislature, but of course there's always, or excuse me, there's still, um, you know, regular training going on. Uh, just before our summer conference, we have our newly elected officials training, which is a day long boot camp for newly elected officials to get, and that really focuses on the nuts and bolts levels of what's gonna be expected of them and, and, and uh, how, you know, what's important ethically and how, uh, you know, what you need to do to uh, make sure that you're, uh, you know, following the open meeting law, all that kind of stuff, and, and a little bit about finances. Uh, we then have uh, twice a year, we have, we have six regions in WAM. We've divided the state into six regions and twice a year, once in the spring and once in the fall, we have regional meetings. And we go out to each of the, each of the regions and have a meeting just, uh, uh, it's, it's usually an afternoon and an evening uh, just in that region. And that includes a business meeting, but we always have a training session there, which lasts between one and two hours, usually closer to, to two. And that, and that is usually, that is based primarily on, uh, you know, whatever's uh, most meaningful at, at the time. And, uh, and that varies everywhere from, you know, from uh, talking about uh, annual audits uh, to talk about call before you dig uh, or some of the other things that I've mentioned. Uh, we, we then also have uh, annually, usually in October, in fact, coming up later this month, uh, we'll be holding our annual finance director's workshop. At the, and we call it the finance director's workshop. It really is, attendance is a little more broad than that. We have a lot of managers and administrators that attend that as well as uh, some mayors and a, and a handful of councilmen. Uh, that attend that, but that, but that specific training, which is usually uh, two to three days long, uh, really um, drills down and covers things at a diff at a at a much deeper level to try to get uh, um, you know training at the staff level uh, for those kind of things. Uh, those financial opportunity, and and I will mention as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, uh, a, really a sixth thing, which is that we have our uh, WAMCAT which is the uh, Clerks and Treasurers Association, the Municipal Clerks and Treasurers Association. And they also uh, provide uh, to the Clerks and Treasurers uh, a wide variety of that, of that training. Another thing that, that WAMCAT does that's really praiseworthy, and, and additionally, uh, I really compliment their elected officials for supporting them in this. Uh, one of the challenges with training is that we have a lot of one person offices around the state. Uh, you know, the, the, the town clerk is the only person uh, at City Hall. And so, you know, it's impossible for them to get away for training without closing City Hall. And, and so one of the things that WAMCAT has done that I've really appreciated is, is they've provided a little bit of coverage for each other, uh, where someone from one of the larger communities will go and cover uh, for a clerk 
that's in a one person office so they can go and get training. And uh, again, that was a, that's, I compliment them. That's a really kind of outside the box way to figure out how to accomplish that. So when it comes to the financial training we offer at that, that's everything from, um, uh, you know, municipal liens, municipal budgeting, grant writing, um, the, the Wyoming lottery, the retirement system, uh, economic development, how the state budget works, uh, how to diversify your budget, uh, how to, uh, fraud, how to uh, eliminate, you know, pro fraud prevention, investment policies and practices. Uh, but most specifically uh, to, I think the discussion today is, is that we also have uh, the Department of Audit involved in that. And I should mention that when we provide our training, uh, it's not all, you know, we put the training together, but we usually bring in subject matter experts to cover uh, each of these areas. And so, uh, it, particularly in regard to today's discussion, uh, we regularly have, in fact, uh, twice in the last year, we've had the Department of Audit uh, doing uh, some training at, at our conferences, uh, specifically in the last year. And, and of course, looking back, I've only been here a year and a half, approximately the same year and a half as Jeremiah, but... Uh, um, Looking back, that the Department of Audit's been involved in our conferences, you know, long before I arrived. But specifically in the last year, at our uh, winter work, excuse me, our winter conference, uh, Department of Audit presented on the elected officials' responsibility in the auditing process, and that, and also uh, a year, almost a year ago now, at the finance directors' workshop, uh, the Department of Audit came and and uh, gave a pretty in-depth training on the F sixty six process. And uh, so, and, and we really appreciate that. And of course, that's not the only uh, department or division of the state that uh, we reach out to and then helps us with that training. We also bring in, um, you know, subject matter experts from the private sector and, and from other, uh, from other uh, local governments as well. So um, the, uh, I think the challenge is, you know, you mentioned earlier about leading the horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Uh, we have very we have good attendance at each of these uh, workshops and conferences, but of course, you know, not not everybody. We we don't get everybody out at each of them, and so um, we've actually made an attempt uh, in cooperation with the, with the Department of Audit. We've actually kind of made an attempt to reach out. Uh, to, of course, we reach out to everybody, but even to identify specific people that that we think would be good to you know, get this training, we try to reach out to them and invite them to that. I think in terms of, uh, and I can certainly answer more questions, you know, whatever questions you have in, in terms of the, uh, uh, whatever questions you have, but I would say that I think that where we can maybe be most helpful is, of course, um, you know, we've got, the, we've got the structure set up to get the training uh, to our folks. Uh, and, and we're all the time trying to figure out what training they most need. If there's, if there's some training that's not currently being provided, that's being developed, uh, of course, we'd be happy to help in developing it. But uh, I think our greater role might be as, you know, providing opportunities uh, to give that training. Certainly, if any, like I say, we're, we're reaching out to uh, state agencies and private sector uh, providers all the time and, and scheduling those. Occasionally, someone reaches out to us and says, Here's some training we think would be good for your members. And so uh, certainly not just limited to the Department of Audit, but uh, certainly if uh, you know any of the state agencies that reach out to us, uh, we, we provided an opportunity for the Department of Transportation recently to uh, travel with us to the regional meetings and, and provide some training there, for example. So we certainly could help in, uh, a lot in the delivery of that training in addition to what, to what we already do. Uh, to, uh, and I just might mention, uh, Senator James had asked about, I think it was Senator James that had asked about specific accounting systems and whether, you know, whether it would benefit to have uh, everybody on the same one in order to provide training. There really are, uh, there are there's a handful really of uh, municipal systems that, uh, that uh, private uh, vendors provide. And there really are two private vendors who provide most of the municipal systems in the state of Wyoming. And each of those vendors actually has a, a pretty thorough training program uh, that they, they, they have their initial training uh, program, but they have really an, uh, an array of 
of trainings that can be provided to uh, to local governments. And so the the uh, the actual vendor themselves actually does a pretty good job providing that training. Uh, I think uh, Auditor Racinus hit the nail on the head when when she you know th those those trainings will really be specific to whatever modules the local government is using. But there are you know there's some basic training uh, in in uh, that that is that doesn't have any you know irregardless of the uh, specific software being used. There are certain principles of you know accounting principles. That's another thing. Uh, recently, GASB 68 is another training we provided recently, and so, uh, at any rate, um, there is a there is really a wide variety of uh, training available out there, not only through us and our partners, but uh, uh, through a number of sources. And we appreciate the things in statute that encourage, uh, you know, local governments to get that training. So, with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I certainly uh, would. Uh, stop for my breath and take any questions that you might have. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. Any questions for Mr. Frazier? Any questions for Mr. Frazier? Mr. Frazier, you know, I mean, one of the things that we're talking about, and yeah, you have to be careful about this because so many of the, uh, whether you're a county commissioner or whether you're in some instances a special district and in, you know, in, in, or, a, or a town or city councilman, you're elected to that office. However, one of the things that we, we consistently find is, is, I think from our discussions before with the Department of Audit, is that when, when uh, two things that kind of pervade when, when there's a problem, and one is lack of training or understanding by not just the, the clerk or the treasurer, whatever that financial manager, whatever that, that person who handles the money is and is in charge of that. But then you, as you also, I think you mentioned it as well, is the fact that that oftentimes that the 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 whether the council members or the board members or the commissioners don't understand their responsibility with respect to the finances and the the records, uh, particularly the financial records of of the entity over which they preside and direct. And so one of the things that that we've been talking about and, and you know, again, we're, I think we're, I'm trying to have an open discussion here today to see if there's maybe things that we should be doing or looking at differently, including the, the mandating of certain types of, of certain types of training occur. And is, is, that, is that a worthwhile way to not only encourage, but require that certain types of training be, being made as a condition of holding of, of maintaining office, you know, the, the one example I come back to is your your county coroner doesn't have to have any special training when, when he or she's elected, but by the end of the first term, they have to take their they have to take their coroner training course, or they don't get. I I think it's condition of them uh, can maintaining office after the after the initial term. So, I mean, is, should we should we be thinking about or doing something that's that drastic, or should we be taking another avenue about how we approach this? And so. I would be interested in some thoughts, both from committee members and, and, and folks that are testifying here today. Did you uh, want James. me to respond? I've got Senator James, Senator James. Yes, Senator James. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think a little motivation might help some of these uh, special districts about um, how about implementing a, a late fee for these reports? That'll help implement, um, kind of motivate them to learn the process and, you know, take initiative to learn how they're supposed to do things and turn these reports in on time. If uh, penalize them if they don't do it. It's always an interesting concept to tax taxpayers with taxpayer money. So. Uh, that, <laughs> Take it from one taxpayer's pocket and put it in another. I don't know how that, you know. I, I did notice in our in our uh, report uh, that we had that uh, you know it's one state that does that. It's a it's a five thousand dollar fee if you're late. But again, you're you're taxing tax you're finding taxpayers then taking and put it in another taxpayer's pocket. So that's an interesting concept. But you know certainly not uh, unique. So we'll go to Representative Obermuller and then we'll go down to Mr. Frazier. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to follow up on Senator James' comment earlier about finding uh, the common ground in the standard chart of accounts. I think uh, that across at least uh, similar types of entities, uh, counties, cities, uh, water districts, and all of these have enough similarity to develop a standard chart of accounts uh, to on which to uh, build then the more specific picture that they might have. But the standard part of it is important from the state auditor standpoint, because when you're auditing, one of the biggest things involved there is analytic review and to be able to compare those numbers across uh, lines of different counties, different cities, different uh, special districts is important. And I, I personally would like to see the development of standardization in how the accounting is done, no matter, <clears throat> and that's different than from, and that's a different issue than the uh, software that you use. Uh, the, the, it's the same issue, whether you're doing it on a, by hand on a spreadsheet or doing it with a specific piece of software. Uh, the standard standardization of accounts is a separate issue in and of itself. And I would like to see some, uh, some movement in that area. Uh, if it needs to be legislatively, maybe that's one thing we need to look at. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Mayor. Mr. Frazier. Yes, Mr. Chairman, just uh, in, re in response to your question uh, just a minute ago, um, you know, I, I typically prefer, prefer the carrot to the stick, but uh, I will say that, that that's kind of one of the things that we riddle through here regularly is, you know, how do, how do we get, what's keeping people from, from coming? And, and uh, you know, in some of the places, you know, I mentioned already the small staff, sometimes it's just hard for someone to even leave the office to go uh, get training. Of course, small budgets are another, are another impediment. Uh, one of the things that we're experimenting with uh, in a couple of weeks here for our for our uh, finance directors workshop is that we're not going to have a registration fee for it. We typically have a small registration fee, uh, which goes to cover the expenses of uh, putting a primary, you know, primarily the food expenses at the thing, but uh, to cover the expenses uh, for that. And this year, we've decided uh, that the association would just cover those expenses, and so we're actually offering registration without a fee, and 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 that's both in order to experiment and see how the reaction is and also in recognition of the fact that our communities are struggling. And so it's a way that we can ease the burden a little bit on that. But I think, I think uh, you know, again, even if you were to require training, uh, there's still gonna be issues that uh, make it problematic for folks to get to that. And so um, while you're thinking about, uh, you know, enforcement, uh, and I know it's, it's easiest to legislate enforcement uh, but uh, you might also uh, think of, uh, you know, we have a lot of folks that uh, want to take more training and it's just not practical either within their budget or just within their uh, size of their organization. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frazier. Uh, Representative Obermuller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This question is for Auditor Racinus. Um, can the state uh, software platform be used by counties, cities, special districts, who can actually use that as a platform for their accounting environment, or can they not? Mr. Chairman, um, Representative Obermuller, um, it cannot be used, the way we pay for it now, it can't be used by anyone but the state. And um, in theory, those entities could purchase the same software, but that goes back to the, it would, it would really be overkill for a lot of, uh, a lot of those, for essentially all of those entities. We actually talked to our, our vendor, I think I meant to say this last time, and asked them about, uh, you know, gosh, what does this look like for smaller entities? And they attempted to offer a a that offer the platform um, a stripped down version for for smaller municipalities and they it was a fail they abandoned that effort because again it it was cost prohibitive um, it's just not in their business plan if that's I'm probably not articulating that very well but it's not it's not a good fit for those smaller for those smaller. Mr. Mr. Chairman. 
Sure, go ahead, Representative uh, Getting back to the fir very first thing you said about paying for more users of your system. Uh, um, I'm wondering what that looks like. I mean, uh, accessing that system uh, by a county, for example, on based on the fact that you're you're paying for more than apparently you're paying for one user. What if you're paying for yourself and all the counties, for example, and then they have then they can access their own little portal world into your system with their own setup. What does that look like, or do you have any idea? So, Mr. Chairman, Representative Obermuller, and I apologize because I'm not, I, I think I'm understanding your question. And I, I think that the hard answer is I don't know. I don't know that the product accommodates that setup. And I'm wondering if um, De uh, Deputy Troutwine, do you have anything to add to that thought? She interfaces with the vendor more often than I do. Go ahead, Evie. Mr. Chairman, Representative Over, Overmuller, the, um, the, the way our contract is currently set up, we actually do not pay based on user. So we pay for different services and modules that are offered. And um, we actually were in negotiations with the vendor earlier this year regarding our 10% cuts and tried to make the argument that we needed to have sort of a, a per user cost. Um, and that's not the way the current contract is set up or the way that they price the systems. But back to Auditor Racinus's comments, again, it's the, the system is right now too robust and the way it's set up is it's based on a biennial budget. I think that a lot of these smaller uh, cities, towns, counties might struggle. We'd have to configure the system differently. And I guess we could look into that, but I don't know right now if it could accommodate some of those types of changes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right, I mean, it, it, it's it's not unlike, you know, if I, like in my office, we have QuickBooks. On QuickBooks, we can set up, we can have my my firm, if I want to, I can, I, you know, I can have, I, and I do, I keep track of a couple of different entities on that. And, I, and inside the system, we're able to set up a different entity and treat that mm -hmm. entity separate and apart from any other entity that's also got its, in that system and sounds to me like you you know that that's what would have to happen they're not it wouldn't be in your books they have to you know and i don't even know if that system is, is created but like, as you said it's a you know it's a most most of the most of the governmental subdivisions that we're talking about could get by with quickbooks or a spreadsheet as opposed to having the the type of capability and the, and the reach that your system has, Madam Monitor. I think that's what you're trying to say. Representative yeah. Overmuller has rebuttal. Uh, no, just to follow up in agreement that that's exactly on something like QuickBooks, you can set up many users on it. And it just seems a little frustrating that you spend, you know, a few hundred dollars and you can have several users, but you spend millions and you can only have one. Uh, you know, where is, is there any simplicity to that system at all that would allow a little, little entity to use that facility, to use that foundation to just do their little work, just like if it's, that, just as if it were QuickBooks, I yeah. guess is my question. Mr. Chairman, Representative, I, I mean, I, I don't believe there is, but we'll, we'll figure out a better way to make, to ensure that there isn't because that's a good question. I guess my, I'm sure that there is my, one. <laughs> my 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 sassy answer would be as soon as the state's finances and budgetary accounts get simplified, we could totally maybe <laughs> yeah. I, so and I think that's the struggle with with why I'm not explaining my myself very very well. And I mean, obviously, um, the the product that we use does accommodate different entities, um, you know, we, we have all different agencies using it, um, but it is bound, the entire configuration, so much of what we're paying for is the configuration and the, the maintenance of a system that is specified around, um, and Edie brought up a good point, 
the biennium is is really really uh, an anomaly, and um, there's a lot of configuration and special accommodations that we pay for to make the system do that. And so I guess uh, again, not not being a an IT person, I I don't think we can have another instance of that that folks can just uh, tap into and use. But I mean, one last comment, I mean, you brought up one of the biggest challenges is that would, before you can have a standardized system that gets you anywhere, um, whether it be amongst special districts or, or um, cities, towns, counties, you have to have your standard chart of accounts, which is almost a heavier lift, well, probably is a heavier lift than finding the right system that works, that works for everyone. Just to follow up, Mr. Chairman. Uh, sure, go ahead, Mr. Representative. Just curious as to why you think it's a heavy lift to have a standard chart of accounts, say for counties. I, I mean, it's at least a basic standard that you build off of. Mr. Chairman, Representative Obermuller, I, I guess just being very honest, I think that would be more difficult politically than than actual structure structurally. I, I do think I do think it would have to be legislated. I think it would be um, a challenge, um, a challenge to have everybody agree on the same chart of accounts. And a lot of accounts in cities, towns, and counties may be tied to specific co municipal code. Um, so it it's certainly complicated, and of course it can be done. Uh, but I, I think that would require a um, I'm not sure all the carrots in the world would, would get that done, but I might be being too pessimistic. And I guess I'm speaking um, several years before I came into the office, the current state auditor uh, did, a, did a chart of accounts update for the state of, just the state of Wyoming, which she had complete legal purview over. And the difficulty surrounding that, I think it would be a preview for, for some of that. I do, I mean, I'm, I don't uh, mean to sound belligerent. I think that's a, a wonderful, wonderful idea because it certainly allows standardization on, on training. It allows one entity to, to say to 10 different municipalities the same thing and they all understand it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Have, have, and in addition to that, having the chart of accounts is one thing, making uniform usage of the chart of accounts is entirely another as well. So we've had that discussion several times, haven't we, Madam Moderator? Indeed, Mr. Chairman. So anyway, thank you for that. I, you know, I, we're, we'll, give this some, we'll give this some more thought, but I, again, I coming back to that, I mean, coming back to the people we've got on the, on the line today, they're testifying. We've got counties, we've got municipalities, we've got the auditor's office, um, we've got county trade. We've got the uh, county treasurers on here. Would it would it be worthwhile, in your opinion, if we looked at legislation to mandate some training? So, Trudy, I see you raise your hand back there. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. I hope I'm not speaking out of turn for the other treasurers, but I think it's more. Uh, we're learning the terminologies and how to do the reports that are required of us and having training that way. We all have, um, I feel, accounting systems that are working for our, our counties, but it would be more so training, learning what they want from us. Um, like on reports, do we have a certain public fund in the right line item? And then when it comes to training the smaller boards, I don't think, again, it has to do with what their accounting system is. It's more so when I spoke with to um, fire districts years ago, they didn't even understand how distribution worked. They were so thankful that they understood how that money came into us and we distributed it back to them. They, I feel that the assessors, the clerks could, could help them with their budget process and understanding how to even ask for the mill levy that they're getting. 
that's more the training that I feel the treasurers were thinking up, not necessarily the accounting part of it, if that makes sense. No, I, I, I don't think our, our problem in some, in some instances, and, and Jason, uh, Mr. Cummings, you guys might jump in here, but you know, one of the things that we've, we've been, been concerned about is are, are a couple of things. One is the, the compliance with the audit requirements that are, re, that are required of, of the various political subdivisions that are out there and, and their reports into the Department of Audit. That's one is trying to make sure that, that those are complied with and they've got what they want. In addition to that, we, we've seen in the legislature in the, in the last several years, uh, you know, attempts and legislation, some of it's successful, some of it unsuccessful, to come in and carve out exceptions from some of the reporting requirements uh, that, that certain special districts have from all other special districts. And, and the more that we start to diversify from, you know, these kind of uniform reporting requirements, um, you know, I think that creates its own issues. But so one, we've had just, just the compliance and getting the reports in. The other one, the other issue that we've had is, is in the audit reports, there's various uh, letters that go back out. There's a report or a letter that goes back out from the auditors, whether that's the Department of Audit or whether it's the, you know, whether it's a private CPA firm that comes in and audits that comes out and, and identifies various either irregularities, deficiencies, or problems that they find with their accounting systems. And so we, we, find, that, we find that the follow-up on those and, the, and, and, and making corrections to certain issues that the auditors found may not have affected the opinion. And the left were findings that the auditors had that needed change that there might be, might be for uh, documentation, substantiation, or in some cases, uh, things that would lend security and, and, and uh, transparency or accountability to the use of public funds. And so we're looking at that and, and seeing in some cases, absolute intransigence, uh, you know, refusal to even comply or to make corrections that are needed to make sure they're, what they're, they're when the reporting is accurate and two, that they're, that they're the appropriate safeguards in place. And so there's a couple things that we're hearing back that we find a little bit disturbing. Um, you know, we've got, you know, 99 municipalities, we've got uh, 23 counties, we've got, uh, you know, between four and 500 special districts out there. So there's a lot of things going on, but at the end of the day, we still need, you know, the legislature need to have some oversight to make sure that both the accountability and transparency of public funds are both uh, required and, and met. And we're struggling with how we do that, and hence why we're having this discussion today. So, I don't know that we'll resolve this much further. Is there any other, any other questions or comments that you have for any of our of our uh, guests today, members of the committee? Senator Drew. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, <laughs> I've been following along here, and maybe I'm just a little too dense, I guess. But Mr. Shaw, I was going to start with you, and I'll prove how dense here in just a minute. Just, uh, anyway, uh, Mr. Chavez first. I'm trying to get a handle on how big of a problem do we have. I heard you say in testimony earlier that that you know you send out a letter, then you send out a second. By the time you send out a second letter, and then I heard the treasurer mention that then maybe with a little bit of prodding about withholding of funds, that we get it cleared up to what I thought I heard you say is one hand worth of fingers of how many people that are out of compliance at that point. Is that generally what I heard, Mr. Chavez? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Drew, uh, yes. By the time we get to um, the end of December, we're usually down to single digit entities that um, have not reported. Okay. If I can continue, Mr. Chairman, sure, um, then, then before the, before the next time we meet, can I get a list? Can the entire committee get a list of exactly who they are and how much and, and what, and, and what their general, just, just their general overall make who they are, cities, towns, political subdivisions, whatever, whatever entity they are and how big they are and what the problems that were identified. Fair enough? Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Guru, 
Uh, yes, we can we can do that. Um, just on a, on a related note, every year when we publish the cost of government report on our website, we do also put a file out there that um, says which entities are not compliant as of that report date. Um, but that additional information is not out there, and we can get that for you. Great. Second point, and and I too, um, along with the along with our chair, the former county commissioner. So I know that there's a certain reluctance from county commissioners to get too far into this because they don't want to get left holding the bag on running running in a small service improvement district or, or sending out water bills or doing something like that. So I think at some point, and I also heard uh, Commissioner Novotny say that these were, you know, all the all the statutes are strung all over the place about how these are run. And I guess I'd like to hear from somebody, and maybe it's the commissioners or, or um, maybe ourselves, um, is there an appetite amongst this group to try to come together with some sort of legislation that brings, that brings them together from a, from a compliance point of view and nothing further, just making sure they're compliant? Is that something that maybe we want to try to take up to try to, if we identify this as a big enough problem, do we want to do that? I don't know the answer to those. I think the answer to the first would help me drive the answer to the second. And that's really kind of where I see us sitting right now, or unless I'm missing something. And then the chairman, I think, brought it all together from there. So, no, I think that's, I, I'm trying to identify one, if, if the problem's big enough to address, and two, do we have the proper tools in the toolkit to address it? And you know, I, 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 we're just trying to understand yeah. that and, and how we get there. And, and and what what I'm hearing is it doesn't seem to be that big of a problem. And maybe that maybe it's uh, uh, you know maybe maybe it's a, maybe it's a problem that's under control and the safeguards are adequate. I I have no desire to sponsor or bring legislation if it's not going to solve a problem. I don't. I don't believe in legislation that look, looks for a solution. Yeah. Uh, I wanted legislation that that solves something, not that looks for a problem that can solve. Then the the other the other issue that that we've talked about then is had to, it has to do with generally corrective actions that are identified in audits, whether they're performance audits of departments. Or in some cases, we've got corrective actions recommended from uh, that are in these other audits that, that sometimes go seem to go unanswered. And in my mind, that was a little bit bigger issue. But uh, I don't know that we need to keep everybody on the line to have that discussion today. So if there's no more, so Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question for Auditor Racinas. Um, so in this file, in this uh, memo, Nebraska and North Dakota has uh, the state auditor conducting the audits. And this gets back to an issue that I've been really uh, passionate about since entering the legislature in 2017, which is removing the Department of Audit uh, from, the, uh, from the governor's, from the, replacing it in the state auditor's office, which is where it was in the original constitution. Uh, original constitutional structure. And uh, the response we've gotten back typically is, well, uh, the state auditor, it's its improper for the state auditor to be writing the checks and also doing the audits. And um, I guess my response is uh, now Nebraska and North Dakota are doing that, I guess. It, it was clearly in our original constitutional structure. So is there a way they're doing it that that uh, is unique or, I mean, what, what why are they able to do it, but we can't here in Wyoming? So Mr. Chairman, Representative Gray, and thanks for bringing that up. I know we've chatted about this before. You said Nebraska and who else? North Dakota? Yeah, it's at the end so, of the... And um, j just for, just to be able to say this out loud, um, Def in definition terms of my statutory duties, um, state auditor is a, a misnomer for sure because I don't audit anything. That is the 
statutory uh, duty and, and powers of the Department of Audit. So um, when I look when I look through, and I actually have my uh, my my 2020 directory for all the states of who's the state auditor and the state comptroller, and I, I flip to Nebraska and their auditor, they have an entirely separate comptroller. So um, and 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 so Representative Gray already referenced this, but a, a very basic accounting tenet in separation of duties is you can't have the same entity in control of the assets um, and recording the assets and then you know uh, auditing them as well. It said another way, you can't audit yourself. It, that's not that's not really a you, you don't want somebody to be responsible for for auditing themselves. So whether whether the state auditor's office had those duties placed with it or not is is certainly a political question that has been decided by the legislature uh, before, but it would involve, for example, if the legislature were to say, "Okay, state auditor, you're going to do all the you know audits," and the Department of Audit goes away, not to scare the Department of Audit, but say that did happen. Um, I don't think it's a compatible duty for me to continue being the comptroller. So those states that you mentioned, Nebraska and, and North Dakota, they have, um, they have entirely separate comptrollers in, in different offices. Go ahead, Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just, I'm really perplexed by this because I always have been. And because the way the Department of Audit has evolved, they're, they're mainly, they're performance audits. So really, I mean, they're somewhat auditing what you're doing, but mainly the auditor's office is taking the invoices and paying them, right? I mean, and I'm not trying to make it too simplistic, but that's how it's evolved. Now, when, when you say, well, you shouldn't be auditing yourself, to me, that's what we're doing right now is, is um, and I'm not trying to talk about, you know, make it personal to the Department of Audit here, but it's in the governor's office. It is appointed and, and reports to the governor as the other agencies do. And mainly what the state audit, what the Department of Audit does is audit other agencies, audit political subdivisions, a little bit of a different issue. And so I, I just, maybe I'll open it up there, but, but, I've never understood that that response because to me that's more what we're doing now. And I I, I understand what you're saying from 30,000 feet up, but in terms of how it works out on the ground, in terms of auditing yourself, we're more in that position than we would be if the state auditor's office would be doing it. And even if they maintained the controller duties, in my opinion. No, I Go ahead, Madam Otter, do you have a response? Okay. Mr. Chairman, Representative Gray. Um, no, I mean he 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 makes a, a point that is not inaccurate, without a doubt. Um, I, I would say uh, the the Department of Audit doesn't audit my work per se. We're audited extensively by the external auditors, and then that comes out in both the CAPR and the compliance report. And so that report is very important because it tells, um, you know, the people of Wyoming, including all of you, here's here's what the state auditor is doing right, and here's what the state auditor is doing wrong. So I'm certainly no, you know, I'm not auditing my own work now. Whether whether the Department of Audit is auditing their own work or or with they're an internal audit function, I think is, is what you're getting at and what's the efficacy of that. I, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a valid conversation. I think the point I wanna make is um, it, it would be slightly more complex than just plunking the audit function back in or, or in the SAO. Uh, Senator Bouchard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, I just want to make note that we're we're circling back to 
probably conversations they had in 1989 when they got rid of the state examiner. So, I mean, I, I would also, I would like to go back in history and see what was the reason for taking away the examiner because they, they were charged with some of these tasks and find out what the real background was. Did somebody get mad at the examiner? Was the examiner doing too good a job? I mean, so anyway, I just want to make note, we're just circling right back to this point where somebody should be looking at things. So, so Abby, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, um, when they did the reorganization in the early 90s, there were the Ferrari reports and LSO has a copy of those and they do mention the state examiner. I can get those sent out to the committee. Okay, thank you. Why don't you go ahead and why don't you, why don't you do that? Um, so anyway, thank you. Is there anything else? Uh, I th you know, I, 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 we've, I don't know. We've made. Uh, you know, I progress is hard. I've, most has just been fact finding and and just learning more. We appreciate uh, your attendance today. We appreciate all those who came and testified. Um, we'll have, you know, I don't know if we'll, I don't know, if, I, I don't know if we'll be uh, taking any legislative action based upon what we've heard today. And we'll talk about that later, but we want to thank uh, everybody for their participation on this subject. And uh, if there are no other questions, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and dismiss, we'll go ahead and let the rest of these folks uh, head off. It's public meeting, stay on as long as you want, but uh, you can attend as long as you want, but we'll, we go ahead and dismiss you from, uh, from our meeting, our meeting. Thank you again for your attendance and, and your input today. Thanks so much. Madam Otter, it's always good to see you. Was there, was there anybody, was there any public comment on this, Abby? Mr. Chairman, Bobby Franks had originally um, submitted comment. She's still heading up the special district task force. Um, she was unable to be here today. And she, and she didn't send anything in writing? She didn't send um, she, since she submitted comments through the form online and I believe it went out to all the committee members. Oh, okay. I, I, thought I, I thought I remembered seeing her name somewhere and, yeah. and, uh, and then she wasn't here today, so. Yeah, something came up, Mr. Chairman, last minute then she wasn't able to be on the call. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, members, are there anything else on on this uh, on the uh, item number uh, eight before we move on? Representative Obermuller. Can't hear you, Representative Obermuller. Helps if I click the right button. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I was wondering if it would be uh, appropriate for the committee to follow up with a memo to the state auditor about the platform and whether that platform is accessible uh, to other uh, uh, government agencies within the state. Uh, I just I just feel like there's there's something there that in terms of of uh, consistency and chart of accounts and all that that just can be developed around a more centralized environment that might actually save a lot of money in the long run also. So anyway, just a comment if anybody wants wants to uh, say let's do that or let it drop. You know, I, I you know the, the issue that you always just have is you've got you know, trying to find that right balance between what the state does and 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 uh, you know, well, you know, providing and allowing these locally elected uh, folks to control what they do. I mean, I, I I do think we want to provide oversight. I you know, and I I don't know where that you know that line is a little bit fuzzy. And I you know, I uh, you know, I, I think they do. You know, again, that's why we undertook this is because. We do have an oversight responsibility as a legislature on these publicly. I mean, these are authorized by statute. We created the statutory framework that allows these things to exist. And so, I, you know, I think I think there is a responsibility to provide some oversight on those things. How far that how far is the oversight extend down to providing and requiring charts of accounts or 
requiring certain certain accounting systems beyond, you know, the to, I, I don't know how far you get down the the weeds. I don't not necessarily oppose, but I'm I'm ca I'm cautious about it all. Well, Mr. Chairman, if I may, this is a, a request to find out what the potential for it is as a platform. Nothing more. I, I don't I don't have a problem with that. I I don't know that you know I. I uh, you know, they obviously have made some inquiry, but I don't know how extensive that, you know, and dedicated that inquiry has been. So is there an app, you know, just, you know, take a quick poll. It's not an official action. How many members do you, how many of you be in favor of sending that letter and making that inquiry of the state auditor? This is a, just a straw poll here. We got one, two, three, four. Anybody particularly opposed to that? Raise your hand if you're opposed to that. So you got four in favor and and five that don't care. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, let's go. Well, well, Senator Bouchard, we voting or do you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to just add something. I mean, there there are other options out there like uh, Open Gov and and uh, I I have just so you know I have emailed them to find out what they have and because I think. I think I know a little bit about the, the, the state system. It's pretty elaborate. And as they dial down into municipalities, they work with big municipalities as well. So some of the things that we're looking at is very small, uh, uh, even districts that are using uh, spreadsheets. I think there's a value though, if we can find a, a solution that basically has as many bells and whistles as you want, for, for smaller type districts, but have the accessibility from the state level also for training and uniformity. So I think there's some other options we should we should uh, look at before we spend a lot of time with, I think it's GCI, is that the company that we use, but. Uh, well, and so I, didn't, didn't the auditor, didn't the auditor take a look at, at open, openbooks.gov before, I mean, did they, didn't, does she have some familiarity with that? Because I think it uh, uh, seemed like she had a, a lawsuit and some other things that, not this particular auditor, but the office of the auditor. Uh, had, they, I think they have uh, some familiar, more than passing familiarity with that. I, so do we expand, do we expand the letter then? I think what I'm hearing from you, Senator Bouchard, is maybe we expand that inquiry about that or are there other platforms for which the the uh, state treasurer is aware where you could have some both capability and, and provide an opportunity for uniformity among some of these other political uh, subdivisions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That would be great. That I guess that would solve both, everybody's, uh, or well, at least both sides of the aisle problem here. Both, I mean, one from the CPA aisle and one from the ordinary guy aisle. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Obermuller. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, that, that's uh, that's a good idea to expand that. And you know, the I guess one of the ideas that I'm just you know just laying in the back of my head is you know to try to simplify things and not make them more complex. And if if you have people that are just have some basic training in input, just inputting data, and if it's into a centralized system, to be able to input the data and then get the reports spit back to you in a very simple way. It just reduces the level of training that the person responsible for accounting needs to have if you have that kind of a plug and play system. So that's kind of what I'm driving at with this, I guess. Okay. You, Mr. Chairman. So Abigail, do you have enough from that that you can start to draft a letter from our discussion here? Mr. Chairman, I think we do. And we can always go back and listen, which is the beauty of YouTube. <laughs> Listen to our inane ramblings. I'm sorry about that, but yeah. No, we can get something drafted for sure, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. Anything else, members, before we move this, move on to the next topic? All right, let's go ahead and we'll move on to uh, the uh, last uh, topic. Um, not, not the last item of business, but the last topic was the state agency performance reviews and follow-up. And so when we when we got on these, uh, um, Abby, who uh, 
Who put those together? Was that you or who was that? Mr. Chairman, Carla and Jonathan put all of these together. Okay. If you have questions, they are definitely your people. So let me, you know, I don't know if we need to go. I mean, I read through, I read through these last night. These are all, in, if the body remembers, we decided we'd start off and write these letters. And uh, for some of the responses, most of the responses I found were, were reasonable responses. Um, the two that I found a little bit surprising were, uh, um, the one of the one the, 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 the one that I found the most there was a couple of responses that talked about when they were at when they were when the Department of Audit had found that there were uh, uh, issues with respect to their disaster recovery plans, and they basically just pointed the finger at um, ETS and said that's ETS's responsibility, and and that was that was one I thought was a little bit alarming. I thought I thought uh, I. I don't think uh, uh, Director Knopp got back on, uh, Knopp got back on uh, line, but I mean, it was, and then it was, and then I, I liked his response was like, well, that may be their performance deficiencies, but we've changed our performance deficiencies, which I, are our, our performance uh, measures. So, you know, which is a, which is a novel approach, but uh, you get to do that at some point. Um, but, um, other than that, I thought I thought overall I thought the responses were were pretty appropriate and so that so let's turn it over to Jonathan and and you said it was Jonathan and who else and Carla Mr. Chairman Jonathan and Carla so as you went through were there any particular responses to you that stuck out to you that you think we should follow up on further we've got a few of them online here but uh, uh, go ahead Jonathan. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, so we sent a letter to the Department of Revenue and we did not get a response from them. So I believe the director is on the line right now. And then um, we also asked Department of Workforce Services and um, Office of State Lands and Investments to, to be here to talk about their responses. And, um, and also, like you said, the director Knopp to talk about disaster plans and and other issues with um, the uh, state, uh, is it public defender or state lands or investments, Carla? Okay. Um, and, and yes, and uh, and uh, public state public defender wanted to to be here to explain their response because okay, of it. Well, why don't we just we'll just start down here and go through the list then. So we are on here, uh, Diane. We're glad to have you. Uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for showing on. We we uh, are just following up on some of these performance reviews, and we we did get your answers, did read your responses. But why don't you go ahead and elaborate on anything you want to elaborate on, or anything you want us to know that you would like us to know? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, good to see everybody. You know, I just really just wanted to be available to answer questions because I know um, you know what we do is sort of outside the norm of what other agencies do, and and our policies and um, the audit and what the audit surrounded deals with court um, language and lingo. Um, so I wanted to be available to clear anything up in case my response was not as clear as I thought it would be. Um, but in essence, we were we went through an audit in uh, 2014. It was based on our fiscal year 13 annual report. It's a, it was essentially a performance measure review. Um, we were audited because we filed our annual report late in, in fiscal year 13. So, so that was sort of the red flag that made them um, think they needed to come and talk to us. Um, as I said in my letter um, to you, Mr. Chairman, and what I told the Department of Audit back in 2014, I viewed the audit as a positive experience. I think we can all learn um, how we can do better. And we certainly learned that we needed to put things in writing. We needed to establish policies and procedures, both fiscally um, and mostly how we count cases. Um, our performance measures are always based on uh, cases that courts appoint us to during a fiscal year. So we don't look at open cases total in terms of performance. We don't look at how many cases we've closed. We only look at cases to which we've been assigned. Um, and we learned that we needed to do a better job um, at telling the courts what we needed before they appointed us and then training and explaining to our staff what the rules were. 
Um, I've conducted since that time personally with my legal assistant staff. Um, they're the ones that enter the data that I based all of my budget um, requests on. Um, I meet with them once a year. I did not meet with them in 2019, however, so I conducted a half day training um, in January of this year, January 8th specifically. And we, wa we walked through all the rules um, again. In order for us to properly open a case and say we have to provide representation to a defendant, we need certain paperwork from the court. Um, we need two things. We need the charging document that shows that the defendant is charged with the crime for which he's entitled to counsel under the Public Defender Act and the Constitution of this state and this country. And we also need proof that they qualify financially for our services. What we learned in the audit was that although we may, be, we may have gotten those two documents from courts, sometimes those documents didn't have the same docket numbers on them. Sometimes the judge hadn't signed the order. Sometimes the dates from the court didn't correlate with what we had in our in-house database system where we enter that information. And so we changed um, a lot of little things. We require our staff to stamp um, with a separate stamp that they've received the documentation on a given day. They have to enter that information within 48 hours of receipt. Uh, they have to get my permission if they go outside um, that realm, if you will. And we've had to spend a lot of time with courts trying to make sure that they were doing things the way we needed them to be done. Um, we've been utilizing Google Drive to upload some of that information so we weren't just relying on attorney files. Um, I know that there's an, at least one attorney here and, and I think he would agree that attorneys aren't great at keeping their records in a, in a in necessarily an organized fashion. So we added that requirement. And then um, from that time forward, we've been developing policies, um, most of which I gave to you. I think I gave um, copies to Abigail um, and Carla, um, all the policies that we have initiated since that time frame. And the only thing we didn't do, and this was a discussion we had with the two um, employees for the Department of Audit, was we didn't, we have not written um, a recovery disaster plan for our computer um, stuff if you will. Um, we think ETS is who we pay to do that. So we've never developed a policy around that. We rely on ETS to ensure that they can recover our data in case of an emergency. But certainly if this committee or anybody thinks we need to learn those things and, and develop a policy around that, we will. Um, and and that's, that's a good question. And that's we, we brought that up with uh, Director Knopp earlier, with Gordon earlier, about that, you weren't you weren't the only uh, department that that said that kind of similar thing, and so right. we just, we're just trying to follow up. Uh, obviously, disaster relief plans uh, um, aren't really important until they become extraordinarily important, right. and uh, and so we, you know we're just we're going to follow up with that and and make sure that we've got that we get progress set up on these disaster relief plans. You know, it's particularly in light of what happened with. Uh, Campbell County Memorial Hospital mm -hmm. this last summer when they were held, to, you know, when they got their ransomware attack. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, that it's, you know, there's that kind of disaster. Plus, obviously, we could, uh, any number of disasters that could happen. So, you know, we just, we got to make sure that we can function, you know, on, on the other side. And uh, so we're, we're going to follow up on that and we'll, we'll figure, we'll, we'll figure this out together and move forward. Senator Bouchard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I have a question for Ms. Lozano. Uh, some of what you were describing there to me sounded like there wasn't a, real, a business manager because I, I have some knowledge, mm -hmm. like through prosecutor's office that, that you know, and, and when it goes haywire over there, and I won't mention, her, but what happened is they, they, they've had business managers and then they do an HR, uh, reassignment and let other people take those business manager positions that maybe don't have the experience and it goes haywire. So I'm kind of curious, do you have a, a business manager that does all the, the tasks that, because I mean, some of these things are, are those things where somebody has to have the check, the, the clipboard. Mm -hmm. Did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? And they have to compile all that and put it in that file. And like I said, I've seen it happen over in the prosecutor side where there's a business manager that does that. And I'm wondering if there is a standard being lowered there. And that's that's the reason of my question. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and Senator Bouchard. You know, that's a great question. And 
we've thought about adding a business manager um, in our budget requests. And, and by the time we came up with that idea of yours, um, budgets were starting to drop and here we are working on phase three of budget cuts. We don't have a business manager and I think we need one. Um, I have a fiscal officer who handles the accounting and the processing and all the transactions of money that comes through um, those types of things. Our HR um, is actually located over at a &I, so I don't have an HR person who works in our agency, which by the way, I think is, is fabulous and that's the way it should be done. And then other than me, there's a deputy public defender who does handle some administrative tasks. Um, he's also a lawyer. And, and I think originally when that was set up, it was designed that you had lawyers running things. Um, but Senator Burchard, I think we need a business manager. Um, and, and I would welcome that change um, and suggestion. You're making Senator Guru Brown. But anyway, the... Uh, <laughs> um, so... How many? So how many? Uh, how many uh, employees are under the uh, under your direction, Diane? Mr. Chairman, we have ninety now that um, the Guardian at Lightem has moved into its own agency. Into their own agency, right? And you're spread uh, obviously among all, all throughout the state. Mr. Mr. Chairman, we are. We have thirteen trial offices around the state who handle all the counties. And then I also have an appellate division located in Cheyenne and then plus the administrative staff. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other, any other questions for uh, Director Lozano? Thank you, Diane. Appreciate you. Thank you. Going up today and, and, and thank you. Appreciate thank that. Thank you. Uh, next on our list is uh, Director Noble. Hello, Dan. How are you doing? Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. I'm doing fine. Um, Dan Noble, I'm the director of the Department of Revenue. Um, first of all, I want to apologize to you and the committee for not um, responding to the, uh, uh, the request for information uh, related to this issue. I've uh, had a, a, an issue that came up within my own family that I've been dealing with. And uh, when I wasn't dealing with that, I was dealing with a new uh, uh, liquor system that just went went live here about three weeks ago. Um, I apologize again for, for not getting back that's, to you, but I am fully aware. That's the state liquor system and not the one in your house, right? <laughs> well, I hope it's the state liquor system. <laughs> okay. uh, the one at my house is is going just fine right now, as a matter of <laughs> fact. <laughs> um, the uh, I am fully prepared to talk about the issues that were addressed uh, in the uh, performance audit that we had back in 2000. And, well, it started in 2015. It actually wasn't concluded in two th until 2017. Um, the, the number one overriding issue associated with uh, the audit was not necessarily whether there were any inaccuracies in, in the information that was presented. It was based on the fact that we didn't retain the source documents to demonstrate um, how much, you know, where those numbers came from. Um, I'd have thought that was self-evident, but it didn't happen. We didn't have the source documentation. That that has been relayed to each of the divisions that they need to retain those documents, and they are. Um, the other aspect of this that I think is important that we need to address, and in some instances it has been, in other instances it hasn't, is that is, is developing a procedure manual for all of the divisions and so that it can be located in one place. Um, the divisions have documentation, but the fact is it's not necessarily standardized in a format that would be, um, I guess I'd say, uh, passed on with any institutional knowledge. It needs to, and it needs to be. Um, it's not something that has been done, um, but it is something that we're certainly working on. Um, we spend a great deal of time writing procedures as it relates to the financial tra transactions that we're involved in. As a matter of fact, it's for the excise division alone, it's a two volume set. So it isn't like we're, it's foreign to us, but it, this is not an area where we've devoted an awful lot of, of uh, our resources. Um, we uh, do understand the need for this and, and what's odd about it, I have one division that has uh, basically a, a one page document associated with the procedures. I've got another one, uh, one, one of the divisions that actually writes it up as a PowerPoint um, and provides all of the, the, the pictures and everything for it. But as a standardized listing, um, it has not been done. 
um, we certainly take that uh, seriously and we'll, we'll uh, um, certainly pursue it. Um, one of the things I really think people need to understand as it relates to these performance audits and, and you look to what our strategic goals are and I'll just use the excise tax division as an example. Um, the overall principle associated with the excise divisions um, strategic goal is to provide um, compliance with the state's tax laws for sales and use tax through education. I think it's one of the most important things that we look to because quite frankly, when I came to the Department of Revenue in, in 1998, compliance rate through audit was 60%. We felt that it is much better to try to gain that compliance by educating taxpayers as to what the appropriate way to collect this tax is, the appropriate amounts and when it needs to be done. So we've worked very hard over the years. Um, this has been our strategic goal in this in the sales and use tax division for, for probably all the 20 years that I've been, 22 years that I've been here. And the, the real idea is to develop measures that, that uh, seek to make people understand what that what that actually is, what, what compliance actually means. We use the Department of Audit's um, actual compliance ratios that they develop as one of our measures. Um, we, we look to the number of licensees that actually um, um, have hand delivery of their, of, their, uh, um, of their sales tax licenses and um, gives our field representatives an opportunity to, to meet with those people and talk about um, sales tax issues that might be specific to their business. One of the things that I would say about sales tax is that it affects different businesses and different people differently. Um, depending on what your business model is, you may have taxable events that uh, you may not be aware of. And I think it's really important for people to understand that. And so we've focused our efforts on, on uh, compliance through education. We send out a vendor, vendor manual to all new licensees. We send out any um, documentation specific to their industry with them. And when, it, when, it, when we can, uh, we meet with them directly using our field representatives throughout the state. Um, that I think, one of the things that's problematic about what we're doing here is we, gotta, we have to understand, are you going to get a, the exact number that we put down on paper every time you look at it? This is a a dynamic situation. Depending on the day that you choose it, the the, uh, uh, the numbers can change. But one of the things that has been driven home to my folks is when you create those those measures, keep the source documents so that, that when these types of audits come up, you can specifically identify what it is that we were were searching for. And we've taken that to heart and we do it today. And with that, I'll stand for any questions you may have, sir. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate you coming and clarifying today. We uh, hope the family situation is all favorably for you. Any questions for the director? Any questions for the director? I don't see any. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate you. Appreciate you coming by today. Thank you. Let's see. Next is uh, I see. Uh, there you. Thank you. There the director Cooley, Robin Cooley. Uh, Robin and I are classmates. Jonathan, did you have something before we go to the director? Uh, yes, I do. I was just going to explain that we uh, invited Workforce Services in case you had any questions about their progress on their strategic plan or how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected in their task force. And, and with the IT and ETS issues that they outlined in the in the last recommend, response to the recommendation um, about the data inventory and the business intelligence units and that sort of thing. So they can also, I think they were also prepared to explain the response as a whole as well, if, if that is what you wish. Well, I think, I think we, we, we're always happy to hear from the director of uh, family services. So uh, director Cooley, or Sessions Cooley, welcome. We're glad to have you here today. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, I think the, the, the response that you gave to us in writing that, uh, if you want to elaborate on any of those, feel free to do so. Uh, one of the things that we we kind of picked out a little bit of a theme was that it seems like maybe particularly in some of our data security and, and disaster recovery plans, that there may be some holes between our uh, uh, between what ETS is supposed to be doing and what our agencies are supposed to be doing. So if there's 
anything you'd like to elaborate on that, we'd love to hear from you. So we'll turn it over to you, Director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Robin Cooley. I'm the Director of Workforce Services. And I'll just start right um, with that um, third finding that you, you just alluded to, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, just to, just to give you an idea of where we're at in our agency, we've, we've got a limited number of people in the agency that do work on IT issues. Um, they are subject matter experts more than they are IT folks. So, so what we've had them doing for the past, well, if, if we're looking at it, the past 10 years is where we've been working on two programs that have been of particular importance to the agency as a whole. The first one being, and I think most of you are familiar with it, the YUI system. And that was actually a 10 year project. Um, we did just launch our fi final part of that in November, thank goodness. So, so that one we've completed. But the second one is our Power Suite program, uh, which uh, is our worker, workers' compensation claims management system. Um, the, the initial Power Suite system did go live in 2012. Um, and we're working on the, the final completion of that now currently. So that is what our IT folks have been focusing on, um, more so than gathering the data that was requested in the finding. Um, we, we just didn't have the opportunity, we didn't have the resources, to be quite frank, in our agency to divert those, those individuals to putting together policies and procedures around um, the, the, what was mentioned in the finding for systems that were in development. So um, now that we're just about at the end of the, the development process, we're, we're ready to go ahead and work with ETS to put those policies and procedures in place. So, so um, in a nutshell, that's where we're at with, with that particular finding. Okay, thank you, Director. Questions for uh, Director Cooley? I'm not seeing any, so. Robin, thanks so much. Robin and I are old school, law school classmates, so it's always good to see you, Robin. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Ahead. Chairman, if I may, I would like to add as well to that um, your, your comments as it relates to some gaps in dealing and, and working together with the ETS, I think are accurate. I, I think that, um, you know, we've been working great with Director Knopp, but I, I do think that as it relates to the IT resources in our office and their office, getting those individuals together in order to really um, fill in those gaps, I think is going to be important going in the future. So the finding, uh, as we discussed it, um, uh, is something that we're, we're going to be working on for, for sure in the future. If I may, as to the other findings, I would like to just make a few comments to those as well. Um, on the first finding, as it relates to the um, four-year strategic plan, I'm happy to let you know we've had some delays in that. You know, as you know, since that finding was made, we've gone through four directors in this agency and a lot of, of, of internal uh, adjustments in the agency. I, I'll, just, I'll just use that, that word. Um, but we do have a strategic planner on, on uh, staff that is doing a fantastic job of pushing this particular uh, uh, project forward. We've got a mission and vision that we just uh, were able to develop. And then we have a, a strategic planning, planning task force of individuals from across the state in our agency that, that uh, are working on now the goals uh, uh, of how to implement our mission and vision. So they just met this last week and we're hoping to put that entire plan into, uh, into a document and begin implementation of that very quickly. So, so I think that, that one in particular is, is very much in the works and will be completed and ready for prime time in our next uh, uh, annual report that we submit. As it relates to the other, the final finding that you made, the fiscal policy manual, that manual has been completed and you, uh, the finding did indicate that they would like to see us using stamped approvals uh, when we deem necessary and include source documents with each transaction. I'm happy to say as uh, uh, the CFO in our office has been working very hard on these issues, this is completed. Uh, but they also just completed a, a, a form that we send around uh, for all approvals of, of, fiscal, of our fiscal um, 
spending. So that we just implemented that, I think it was last week, and that's a pretty slick, pretty slick form that it's all online. Uh, it goes through all the appropriate processes. Um, I eventually get to see it. I get to see what's being spent. And for me, that's a, a very comforting feeling to know what is what the money that's being spent, where it, the fund is coming out of, what it's being spent on, et cetera. So that's, that is a, a pretty remarkable document or, or a data system, I guess I should say, to have in this agency. And I look forward to using it uh, much more in the future. So, so we're, we're on track with, with all of these uh, findings to be able to give you the, the final uh, reports on them and how we've fulfilled those, those initiatives. Thank you, Director. You bet. Anything else? Uh, Senator Guru. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just a just a comment. As um, a part of my JAC duties, um, the Department of Workforce Services in my portfolio um, as of last last session. And in January, I sat down. Uh, Director Cooley was not there, but her whole team was made available. And we sat down and went over a lot of this stuff and a lot of this stuff about Power Suite and some of the other goals that they had. Unfortunately, within 30, 40 days of that meeting, um, when COVID-19 hit, their world got kind of rocked. And and of all the departments, and a lot of departments have been touched very deeply by this, but the Department of Workforce Services got, you know, got kind of hit from all sides. And so I know they have been working hard on a whole lot of different issues. And now I've been trying to play catch up as they've gotten kind of straightened around from all the unemployment issues and all the other things with workforce services that they've been at handling, but they have done so with, uh, with uh, been working hard to work through all their issues that we pointed out at going through their budget and going through all the things that they've gone through. It's, it's been, it's been a tough slog, but I know they've done a, done a good job and they're really trying to get her back on track. And I want to just say to the director, I appreciate all the help she's given all the folks I know my constituents that have been calling in with little issues here and there. And so I do appreciate it. So thanks. Uh, you had a, I mean, you got, you got a lot of extra work dumped your way here at the, you know, in, in March and April and May, uh, you know, putting together the, uh, you know, expanding the unemployment, making, getting the, uh, to where you could have, you know, partial unemployment claims, uh, uh, the changes that were made to workers comp, the, the other things, I mean, there was, a, you got a lot thrown at you in a very short period of time. And, and, uh, there's a few bumps, but, uh, you know, what, what, you know, it was, it was, uh, you there are a lot of, you, there are a lot of people nervous with your portal on the on, online, but, uh, you know, there just wasn't another way to, to go about some of that. So, I mean, it was, uh, it was between a rock and a hard place and, you know, we could always do better, but at the end of the day, you, you got a lot, you got most of it, you know, you did, you got her done, uh, in, in large degree. So, uh, anyway, thank you again, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you. And um, we've got a pretty awesome team here in this agency. So, um, every one of them, uh, put in the extra hours and did the extra work and got it done, like you said. So thank you. Thank you. Anything else for the director? Let's move on then. We'll go to uh, Jason who's out there. Uh, Jason, we got your responses. Uh, oh, Jonathan, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> we invited Osley uh, because they noted at the bottom of their report that there were open items uh, related to the audit. And in case you had questions similar to the last, the last about ETS rules noted in two and three and specifically that, for example, that the previous director didn't think that uh, they needed to adopt uh, ETS rules. Thank you, okay. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So Jason, with respect to that, what would you like to tell us? Well, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I'd like to extend Director Scoggins' regrets for not being here to address you on these topics. She's currently chairing the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission in Casper and so is disposed at the moment. So I do apologize you have the B team to help you answer any questions you may have related to these findings. 
but as the previous directors have mentioned, uh, we do work closely with ETS as far as data security. I think that's one of the big findings, the last one that we had in our response. And we worked with them since we received the request to provide information back to you. Um, as noted in our response, we were anticipating development of a toolkit that would help us be in compliance with ETS expectations, as well as um, the idea of adopting uh, protocols within rules. Uh, we've reached out to ETS, they've reached back out to us, and we've had that conversation, and we're unaware of a toolkit that was being developed, so there wouldn't be one to be deployed, um, nor would there be a great way in our mind to uh, roll the rules in that ETS currently had in place. And so we're working with ETS to figure out a way, a good formal way to develop those protocols as far as data security goes. I do believe ETS provided you with a response to our response, which uh, basically said that um, we are working through the OCIO uh, approval processes and ensuring that security compliance is housed appropriately. Um, they also made mention as is appropriate that we have a lot of third party systems that we utilize and they're not necessarily housed internally on ETS servers. Um, so we rely greatly on those third party vendors to provide security for us. And we've provided all of that security information to ETS who apparently believes that that's uh, adequate uh, per their protocols. And then of course, everything behind the UTS firewall is also um, uh, adequately protected. So we feel uh, that we do work with ETS well. Uh, we don't have any IT personnel on staff, so we do rely on ETS as far as security protocols go and the like. And, and every time we try to make a change or anticipate a change in our systems, uh, we do reach out to them early and often to make sure they're up to speed with those and, and are in agreement um, with them. We have uh, an ETS business analyst that we, we meet with every other week to ensure that any changes that we make ETS is privy of and, and vice versa. And that seems to be a very good relationship um, thus far. The other two findings, um, uh, as the directors pr prior to me mentioned, uh, one would be the development of a four-year strategic plan. Uh, we have done that. Our latest strategic plan uh, runs through June 30th, uh, 2022. And inside of that finding, we found that, again, we didn't uh, keep all of the necessary information um, from year to year to make sure we were comparing apples to apples. And that was a fair assessment or a fair finding of our agency. And since that finding, we do keep hard copies of all information housed within that strategic plan. However, I will note that we are uh, rapidly changing course from where we were 10 years ago, and a, and a decade is quite a long time, but I will say that we're rapidly changing in that every year our systems become better, they become more robust, they become more efficient for not only the public, but internal staff, and they become more transparent, meaning that we're able to and want to start reporting on different things. Um, to provide better measures of performance um, to all that, that want to look into our agency. So we are retaining those hard uh, copies uh, used for um, the measures going forward, and we'll continue to do that. And we'll also continue to enhance our systems to the, so that the, the performance measures are better uh, reported upon and easier to, to understand. The second one, and one that we feel most important, is the financial uh, security uh, protocols. Um, the first one was that we needed to ensure that a financial policy was instituted and, and updated regularly. We have done that. In fact, the last one was updated in July of 2017, and we're in the final stages of re, uh, finishing another review of that financial policy. Another one uh, was ensuring that we had a good and secure protocol around revenue receipts and the process in which we retain, receive and retain money within the office. One staff member uh, back when the audit was completed was handling all of those duties. And we realized and recognized that that probably wasn't a good and secure uh, way to handle financial processes within the office. So we've separated that out between separate staff members. One receives, uh, one records the, the funds coming in and then the third deposits the funds. So there are, are three different individuals handling that money in that process. Another was an in, um, ensuring that any federal grants that the our forestry division um, uh, distributes are distributed appropriately so that we don't have uh, inappropriate distri distributions occurring. And that was a fair assessment uh, or fair finding within the audit. Since then, we have added additional review processes so that uh, more than just one person is 
uh, reviewing the request for that distribution, ensuring that it's adequate and appropriate to be uh, distributed. So we've added uh, many or a few more levels of review into that process. And finally, um, one, uh, the last part of that second finding would be to ensure that all staff members within the agency understand the procurement process, the procurement policies, and aren't uh, we aren't uh, dedicating funds before the full approval process has occurred. And so within the financial policy that I mentioned earlier, there is a whole section dedicated to the procurement requirements and the procurement policy, and we make sure all staff members are very much aware of that and ensure that all approvals are, are garnered before we do anything that would uh, allow funds to go to leave the agency. So Mr. Chairman, I'd, uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Does anybody have questions for Jason from OSLI? Thank you, Jason. Appreciate you coming back and reporting to us today. And uh, appreciate, uh, appreciate you all and the, and the work that you do and, and glad you guys are making progress. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I think that takes us back to uh, Mr. Knopf, Director Knopf, I, you're back. Yes, sir, Mr. Chair. So, uh, on, on one of the things that we that we found uh, in, in these responses, and I don't know, I don't, I don't know if you had seen, I don't know if you all those all the responses have been made available to you, but one of the things that we seemed to find was that uh, uh, both on uh, data security and data re and and disaster recovery plans that they mostly were going, well, gosh, you know, in some cases it was we have no IT people, so it's got to be ETS. And uh, other people were saying our, our, IT, our IT people, the few that we have are subject matter expertise folks that are working on, you know, discrete systems. And so, you know, they don't have either the bandwidth or the, uh, in some cases, the expertise to go back and, and look at some of those other issues that they're, they're working on. And so we came back down and, and didn't know if you, if you knew that they were kind of pointing the finger back at you, or at least not you, but your, your the ETS with respect to responsibilities for data security and, and disaster recovery issues. And, and we just wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. Uh, and so that, you, so that we, we can start to, you know, I, you know, start to make whatever corrective actions and move forward. You probably are already. And then also there was, uh, you know, also there was, there was a, a performance evaluation or performance audit of, of your division. And, and so you had made some responses. And so, Anything you'd like to tell us in, in regard to uh, either one of those topics, we'd be interested to hear from you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll start with the first one you mentioned. And, and yes, we became aware and, and thank, thank you to Jonathan at the, Jonathan at the LSO for uh, giving us a little heads up on that so we could prepare. Um, what I believe we're finding is twofold. And this is my anecdotal observation with my you know, Mr. Peabody way back machine looking back five years. Um, at that point, it, it appeared that a number of agencies, there, there was a bit of a bitter taste with the consolidation of ETS. And it was, hey, you took my people, it's on you, right? Which I, I understand that makes sense as a human being, right? Um, but what I do believe is the situation is ETS certainly should and, I, and does take care of enterprise data storage and data recovery and data security. Um, however, that's not necessarily true for all of the systems that were within those agencies at that time. Um, so I think there might be a bit of a uh, misunderstanding of IT data security, storage and recovery versus disaster recovery of an entire agency. Um, so what I, would, what I would offer is ETS does provide the service that if something is stored in the enterprise file stores, if something is stored in Google, if something is stored in those enterprise products, we certainly do provide the security, we do back it up and we do restore it in the case of loss. Um, that may or may not be the case as Mr. Crowder alluded to with some of the third party systems as an example that he gave an example to that that third party system provides that service for them. And they have been working with us as, as we've been working with them in, in the recent past to make sure that that's happening for those systems. I do believe there is a gap as, um, as the previous director had mentioned, where we're, we need to address and help agencies 
with the things that ETS doesn't provide service for to make sure that is part of their COOP plans. Uh, we do know that the COOP, the, um, the, the recovery plans, the COOPs, we, we know that's put together with uh, Homeland Security and the agencies and, the, and then we need to weigh in more than we have. That's what we've become aware of since you've alerted us to this is because of that discrepancy, we need to check in with the agencies and see what we can do to help them out with that. Or is there something we can just do for them as opposed to just help them out? That's a question that I don't have an answer to today. But does, does that help address the, uh, the agencies going, hey, we thought ETS did it. Uh, and pardon yeah. me, before I... Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think, I think uh, you know, what the concern we have is, is just, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's just, there, there, we found a gap and we want to alert people so that the, the right things can start to happen. So coming back to something you just said, so when we were talking with Director Curley, we, you know, we talked in particular about, about the, w, w, the UI program, uh, the unemployment insurance program, and also the power sweep, which is the uh, workers comp program that, that manages that data. So when you talk, when we talk about enterprise data, when we get down to some of these systems, and I know the health department's got some of theirs, like Wings and some of the other stuff, are those considered are those considered enterprise wide data, or is that not considered enterprise wide data when you get into these large systems that are housed within a single agency? Um, Mr. Chair, I will tell you that in the past they were looked at as single agency data systems, and um, and, and the philosophy of ETS uh, prior to about a year ago, 18 months ago, was sort of held at arm's length. The idea was ETS would provide the connectivity and the infrastructure for those systems to exist, but those systems were managed wholly by the agencies within which they were contained. Um, and you may have heard my testimony earlier on this that I believe statutorily ETS has the responsibility to have some insight into those systems, for the purpose of looking for uh, enterprise uh, value, for how we could reduce cost and reduce the number of siloed systems. And, and the agencies have been very open to that as we have began that discussion. Um, but at this point, we don't provide enterprise services for the systems you just mentioned, um, but we, we are beginning to work closely with them as our data. We, we established a data team because we didn't even have one uh, 18 months ago. Uh, that was, uh, we, we took some positions inside of ETS. Uh, as people left, we repurposed those positions, hired people, and now we're in the process of getting an inventory to wrap our minds around what is out there. Because in some of the agencies, we didn't know of some of the systems. We, we might have known anecdotally, right? One person in the ETS knew, but as an organization, we didn't have a good sense of that. So, so we are, I, I can't tell you that they will all become enterprise systems. But as we determine that they share enterprise data, as an example, constituent data or resident data between those systems is probably the same. Maybe there's a way to share some of that and reduce the burden as we move forward. As we need to look to upgrade, we can reduce the size of the systems that we need instead of these monolithic systems in every agency. Right. Does, does that make sense or did I just muddy the waters? No, no I, I, I understand. I think what you're saying and, 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 and I get that. I think all we're trying to do right now is we just discovered a potential issue that where you know you know we need the right hand needs to know what the left hand is doing and and so we're just trying to you know we just discovered that we're trying to bring it to the attention of the directors and of you and so that we can make sure that we've got the right coverages and the right plans in place so that our you know both our data is secure both from loss and from and from uh, from breach and as well as uh, you know that the, having the uh, having it available when we need it. So um, just you know, just uh, like all things that we get, uh, you know, you mentioned silos. We're just we're just we just found something that we thought, gosh, this looked like it might be uh, uh, not just a unique problem to one situation, but you know, across the system. Like, and so we're just bringing that to your attention. We'll we'll follow up here in a, you know next year or something and see how that's going. But we just wanted to bring that to your attention and. And we and and you know we appreciate your response and and you know we we appreciate uh, you have you have a different philosophy than your predecessors. Uh, I appreciate that and uh, you know there, you're the third you're the third you're the third director. All of you've had a little bit different philosophy and a little bit different uh, uh, emphasis on what what you're doing and 
And, you know, the situation drove a lot of that, but, you know, we, you know, you've got a broad, a broad system of bringing together your background uh, provides for a broad system of users from varying degrees, uh, varying areas. And so we appreciate your, uh, your kind of holistic approach and your willingness to roll up your sleeves and help out wherever, it, wherever we need to do it. So that at the end of the day, the, the state's better off, uh, more secure and, and more responsive. So appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Any, any, anybody have any questions for director Knopp? Representative Barlow, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I guess for the director, um, statute lays out the responsibilities of, um, of the department and of the director. And I, I, there's a very specific reference to establish and enforce data security and privacy policies and standards for the state data infrastructure. And I guess my question is, is do you think that is, um, that da state data infrastructure is somehow restricted or does not allow you to give guidance to those in-house systems that an agency may have. Um, so is it, is, do you think that guidance or that uh, mandate is broad or do you think it is um, discreet? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Barlow, uh, Vice Chair, uh, I, I perceive that to be broad and, and that's why I'm saying that it, we formed our data team that we did so that we can dive in and provide those prescriptive uh, measures and help agencies with that. But by the same token, I don't just wanna come in with a ill-informed approach. I want to understand the data that we have so that we can put the appropriate securities around it, as opposed to having a one size fits all thing that necessarily wouldn't fit the data at hand. Does that answer your question, sir? Um, yes, I guess when I when I read the statute, there's about four references to data security, and they're all placed in your hands. Um, so starting now is fine, but um, having a plan. But if you look look at and the the good chairman referenced a, a data security that was not in state government; it was actually in a special district in my community. The cost of that data, both in real time and in um, in uh, disruption of service, et cetera, was you know eight figures, um, and and not not about not even considering the cost of quality of life for people that should have been receiving services in a hospital setting. So, um, I mean, these have significant costs. Not having these things in place at one level and at the state level, I would say, could be compounded even further. So, thank you, yeah. Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. And, and thank you for that differentiation. In my response, I was thinking state agencies, not necessarily local and municipalities. However, I will tell you my intent uh, and what we have discussed in my agency is there's also part of state statute that says ETS should be, and the office of the CIO should be working across all branches of government and all levels. So while I may not be able to quote unquote, force somebody to do something, I have yet to find any IT staff in any government organization that are not very open to collaboration and working through situations like what happened up there, but also being proactive. And so as, as we build that capacity for us to do that, I'm very optimistic that we will have that uh, type of collaboration with agencies or other state officials. And for what it's worth, I did do that in my past life. We, uh, we brought together CIOs from across the state, governmental CIOs, because they don't we're not competing with each other and we're solving very similar problems. Um, and to that, I, I also want you to know that we have our deputy director who was the CIO for Laramie County for about 30 years. And, and he is able to reach out and work with counties and that provides us some instant credibility in those situations. Okay, thank you. Other questions for uh, Director Knopp? All right, thank you, thank you, Gordon. Appreciate your time and, and your efforts and your work for the state. Uh, you know, we'll give you we'll give you the pep talk. Go forward and do well, and don't screw it up. So off you go. <laughs> we'll do my best, sir. Thank you for your support. Okay, thanks so much. Um, is there any is there anybody out there? Was there any public comment on this, Abby? 
Mr. Chairman, there is not. Okay, thank you. Well, that brings us down to uh, item 10. Do uh, you want to take a second and stretch your legs or do you want to just keep plowing ahead and finish up? Okay, let's just go ahead and finish up. So down to committee business, uh, heard a lot of, gathered a lot of information today, heard a lot of things. Uh, um, uh, what's, your, what's your pleasure, folks? Mr. Vice Chair. Mr. Chairman, as far as um, bill drafts or consideration for another committee meeting, I guess the only one that I, I heard and saw today, this ETS one, I'm not done with yet, but um, the one that I was most, um, I guess, find the, was the most compelling to me was the sunset date on the Office of Consumer Advocate. It seems like something that would be appropriate for this committee to at least bring forth um, a bill to our next committee meeting, take public testimony on it, and then decide if we want to advance something to the legislative session. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I guess if you're willing to entertain a motion, I would um, move to extend the, the, um, the expiration date of the Office of, Commun Office of Commun Consumer Advocate for five years beyond what it currently is. Thank you. Second. A motion and a second. A quick question: That uh, is anybody here on on corporations? I just was wondering if corporations had taken that up. Mr. Chairman, I can't speak to that, and, and certainly if if they have, that would um, you know our, our motion would be subservient to theirs, and I would make that part of my the discussion would be if they're already taking it up, we'll, we'll leave it alone. But I certainly, certainly think it's worth somebody bringing forth this session as a general session um, so that it's in place prior to that interim where it goes away. Thank well, you. Mr. And, and that's a good, that's a good point. And, you know, if they, if they got, if, if, if you don't do something like that, you know, then, then you start risking your staff getting a little bit uh, jumpy and, and uh, you've got six staff that are, that are, are working reasonably well. Uh, you don't necessarily want to jeopard, jeopardize that and have them jump ship and go someplace else where they feel uh, more job security because that's not been extended. So uh, is, is there further discussion on that? Further discussion? Go ahead, Senator Drew. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I agree. I want to check. I would agree with checking with what corporations is doing because I heard they had taken it up. But if we are to take it up, just just want to make sure, and I know we'll do it, but just make sure that the Public Service Commission is made well aware of what we're up to so they can be totally involved. Um, I don't think they, at least some of the members, felt they were adequately noticed that we were taking it up today and, and were wondering what was up. And so. uh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You gotta, you gotta keep an eye on the man audit committee. You never know what we might do. You never, that's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> but this, this, uh, Representative Pelkey. Just for the record, I have no objection to Representative Barlow's modification of his original motion. Okay, thank you for that. So, um, I, so it just, so all we're talking about is just a simple bill to extend the sunset date for an additional five years, so it goes from 2023, I think it would go to 2028. Is that right, Representative Barlow, Representative, Representative Pilk? So, yeah, so uh, all those in favor of that motion, please, uh, you know, rate, do the, raise your hand. Got one, two, three, four, so I've got six, seven. Okay, so I've got seven. All those opposed, raise your hand. Got one opposed. Okay, so that motion carries. And of course, uh, Abby, that that's that's contingent upon the uh, corporations uh, political subdivisions committee having not taken that up. Okay. All right. Um, other other uh, committee business, gentlemen. Um, just following up, you know, I, I was, I, I, I really enjoyed the memo about subpoena power. We got it in spades. It looked like to me. So, uh, uh, this committee does, uh, 
And if I read your, your, if I read the memo right, Abby, and, and so I, I guess we come back to, you know, one of the reasons we had you do that memo was that we had a number of recalcitrant, my recollection was special districts that had basically told uh, the Department of Audit to pound sand with respect to following up on various corrective actions recommended by the Department of Audit. And so uh, we wanted to know that before we wrote the letter and said, please answer this question or you'll have a, you'll, you'll be facing a subpoena from the committee. And so uh, uh, that's one of the reasons we had you write that, we, we, we wanted to know that memo. And so um, my guess would, uh, my, my, my uh, feeling is that we should follow up on that. Now that we, you've gotten that answer for us, we, I, I think we clearly have the power to, to offer those subpoenas. Um, and uh, I think that uh, we, uh, you, uh, I think Abby, you have that, we do have that list of the, you know what I'm referring to, the special districts that were just, weren't answering those questions. We got that list from the Department of Audit. Mr. Chairman, um, Carla can give you the exact entities, but yes, we received five, I believe from Senator James. And then we also worked with the department to identify five others that had had problems. Okay. Um, those letters are drafted. They're in the review process right now and they should go out this week. And, um, and they're, they're going to, they're going to contain the words like you can give it, you can do it the easy way or the hard way. Huh? We were not going to put that in there. Uh, we found <laughs> some, I did find some old, uh, joint rules um, about how you use the subpoena power. And it definitely says you should invite them to the meeting first <laughs> before you subpoena them. So we, that was the approach we were going to take is to invite them, if, to have them respond probably by the end of the month, early November. If they okay. don't respond, go ahead and invite them to the meeting. If they don't come to the meeting, then go with the subpoena. Okay. If, if it works for you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Representative Barlow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I think that there's a value in actually laying that out for this committee, basically as a as a memo, maybe, and maybe in a in a polite way, laying it out for them as well, saying you can respond, and then you'll get an invitation, and then you'll get a demand. Um, I, maybe that's not correct. I'll leave it to the legal minds that that know how to ramp these things up. But I, I think they need to understand that there is an ultimate stick. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll take a look at your letter and we'll keep all that in mind before we send it out. Okay. okay. And, uh, you know, at a minimum, you know, we'll invite them and, and ask for a response by a, you know, or ask for the response, I guess, was the way it was written was the response, we don't have the responses by a date certain, then it goes out, you know, I guess we can, we can, you know, they can either send us a response or they can confirm that they're gonna attend the committee meeting by a certain date. And if they don't, then we would send out a subpoena. That's the, that's the plan as I understand it, Abby? Correct, Mr. Chairman. I think kind of like what we did with the state agencies, if their response doesn't fully satisfy what the, problems were that are outlined, we may invite them to the meeting. And then if there's no, if there's no response, we'll definitely invite them. And then if their response requires further elaboration, we would invite them as well. Okay. All right. You're way too nice, Abby, but thank you. Representative Barlow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to be clear, this this is going to occur under the, you're going to, the chairman is going to review the letters and approve them and get this sent out. So we have responses and everything in place for our next meeting. I just want to make sure of that. Right. Uh, yeah, you just uh, kind of like you saw with the, the government agencies and the responses on those actions. It's the same the same, same thing. We want those back and we're going to get the answers. And if, if we can't get them to respond voluntarily, then then we'll use the, you know, then I think we have the, then we have the ability to use the subpoena power. But if I understood Abby directly, the, we, that, we there's a little bit of a procedure laid out in our rules about how we use that. And so we we have to navigate that uh, those niceties. Okay, all right. Um, other committee business. Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, just wanted to see where we were at in terms of uh, 
uh, beginning a full audit or a full performance audit. I mean, what uh, we had talked about making a final decision at the last meeting in December and moving forward some documents for that here. Is there any, what's the feeling on that? Well, both we'll open that up to the committee. What is the feeling on that? Members? So, Senator Gray, can you elaborate a little bit more on on uh, on exactly what what action you'd like the committee to take? Well, I mean, I, I think we we try to approve some scoping papers, Mr. Chairman, and so we can get in a position to approve something. Uh, I I think we should try to finish this interim, getting something going rather than leaving it to April after reorganizing after the general session. I don't think that's a good idea to leave that a new manager. I I think we should get it going. And as they've talked about during session, they have less workload. The research division, actually, it's kind of yeah. interesting. And then, and then they can do the audit then. So um, I don't Abby, know. I, Abby, did you send us out a, didn't you or Carla send us out a, a memo on subject on topics? Mr. Chairman, so this, I think it was Monday morning, I sent you we, you had asked us to scope a telehealth project with the labor chairman, um, whether that be research or evaluatory. And I sent those out Monday and there was one on cybersecurity and then also looking at um, efficiency of Title 25 virtual hearings. Um, the second one is probably more, lends itself more to an evaluation. Both of these were identified as issues by the labor chairman we have not really scoped these at all, which is why you'll see I put the TBD in terms of a timeline because we don't know how large those are. I think both of those would have to probably have another research paper before we could actually identify a narrow topic that is a potential for evaluation. Um, we also looked at the MBMS for today, telework, um, which is tied up in leasing. Both of those are probably not that ideal right now for further study in terms of, of an evaluation just because they're both programs in flux. Um, MVMS this year has been an, an anomaly and they really only started collecting the data a few years ago. I think they're also tweaking their own systems. Same with leasing, they're, in, they're starting to change a lot of things right now. So whether there's potential value there, I don't know. Okay. Committee members, what's your pleasure with respect to any of those topics? Mr. Are there Chairman. other? Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, if there are other topics, now would be the meeting if you would like us to do some preliminary research to try and narrow a topic down to find some potential issues that could be teed up at a December meeting. That would be good to get at this meeting. Okay, go ahead, Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, one thing I want to look at is the Public Service Commission more, right? I, that's a potential um, topic. I don't, I don't know. If, you know, I think the presentation today, I'm not saying it's going to go the full distance, but I think a scoping paper in terms of what's, what's the function and, and are, is that being achieved um, in the Public Service Commission would be interesting. You know, and that's a, Senator, I, I can tell you that you know, one of the reasons that we had that is, is just uh, there's been, you know, uh, in particular, uh, Senator Bebout has taken a run at absolutely uh, dissolving the uh, Consumer Advocate, uh, Office of Consumer Advocate more than once. And, uh, and you know, and he's not, he's not alone in, in wondering about the, the, the effectiveness of the Office of Consumer Advocate. Um, they paint, uh, you know, obviously he comes today and paints a very different picture for that. Uh, I'm looking at that and, and part of that discussion today was for us to become more acquainted with that uh, uh, for a couple reasons. One, it's a, it's a part of, of our state government that just is not very well understood. Um, and how many of you even, even knew what they did or even knew about him before, before we had our meeting today? Um, I, I learned a lot with it today and, uh, 
and so is is to kind of get acquainted with that. But the other side of it again is it's one of those items if we look at is is that you know it's a it's a discrete program six employees does it do what it's intended uh, what are the performance measures uh, you know what what are the performance measures by which it should be held um, what do we expect out of it is there additional role that they should make should their role be should their role be defined I thought it was interesting that in the one which was Nebraska only dealt with with natural gas but they specifically told the the big users those industrials they basically said hey y'all are on your own if you want to participate in a contested case or otherwise challenge a a uh, a rate a rate hearing um or a rate request the uh and so uh you know i you know there's there's you know i understand uh, where you're coming from representative gray those are important issues uh, and the corporations folks are going to be absolutely swamped this coming year with redistricting for uh you know it's going to be that's going to keep them really busy um it's a, it's an area that uh we certainly could take some additional look at um are there anything is there anything in particular that that you uh one thing i was thought about was performance measures how do we know and what how do we judge whether or not uh Consumer advocate is doing the office is doing what what they should be doing. Um, it's nice to come and say, "Hey, we 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 went to these hearings, and in almost in all nine hearings, they didn't get what they asked for. Therefore, we must be doing a good job." I noticed in in, some, in one of the reports, there's a few times that that uh, that the uh, Public Service Commission actually awarded less than what the Office of Consumer Advocate had requested. So they went further. So there was the 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 uh, utility company, the electric company, was asking for this. The uh, office of consumer advocate said should only ask for this, and the and the uh, public service commission said, no, nah, you're still not right. It's even lower than that. We should even give you less than why. I think that happened, I think three different times out of those. So I I don't know what those performance measures are and what they ought to be. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't know that anybody in the uh, corporations com committee knows what they should be either. So uh, maybe that's something we could take a look at. Uh, Representative Barlow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To be clear, was Representative Gray talking about the Public Service Commission or the Office of the Consumer Advocate? Because I, I thought I understood it was, a, it was the broader um, topic, the Public Service Commission that Representative Gray was inquiring about. So I just want to be clear on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, and then I'm, I'm talking about that OCA is obviously, as we learn, as we know, is a is a part of the Public Service Commission. So I'm, I was talking about that specifically. But uh, um, what else would you like? Anything else? Anything particular about respect the Public Service Commission or and or the uh, OCA that you would be uh, that you're interested in, uh, Representative Gray? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I'm, I'm interested in how they interact with the IRP. I mean, I, I first I was thinking broader, and then I kind of was listening to, to your points. I think you made some good uh, focusing a potential audit. But I mean, maybe this is just a a, uh, a research project. Maybe I could submit this as an individual legislator. But I've tried to do, I've talked with the attorney there, and I, I still cannot quite get a straight answer of what they can and can't reject and, and, and what in statute we have given them the authority to do in terms of the IRP and, and once the IRP gets implemented, because that's a quote unquote plan or, or they attempt to implement the IRP. Um, so I, I just, anyway, I mean, it, I, at the IRP, they always come back, well, it gets accepted for filing, you know, and, and then it's just a document. Um, that's their response back, but some of that is legal. And I think probably more, I think in terms of the audit function, um, I think President Perkins was kind of uh, a little bit more fleshing out where we could go with an actual audit. But I do have some questions about the overall function of the, the Public Service Commission and, and, um, and, and their statutory authority, but thank you. And so Abby, with, with our name rambling so far, is there anything in there that you can find? I, I think that you, if you, I think there's some preliminary research to do, and then, and then, you know, I think we might be able to help you uh, with with some preliminary research or a white paper of, you know, helping us understand a little bit more. Then I think we might be able to come together 
in our last meeting and, have, and, and give you guys a work assignment. Mr. Chairman, I think we can do that. I think we would put together probably a background paper on the PSC statutory authority. We've kind of already gotten that with the OCA component. And for the OCA, we can look further into, you know, in the eval statutes, there's about seven things that each evaluation or audit has to address. And so we would try going in and identifying how, to what extent we think we could address those in an eval. Some, some I think can be addressed more than others and depending on the scope of the project. Right, and I, that's, exactly, that's exactly what I'm thinking is that, that you can come back and you can give us, you know, I, I guess that, you know, then it's kind of like scoping what, you know, you're, you're, it's kind of a white paper slash scoping project to figure out what it is that we, what it is that if we actually did a program evaluation on the PSC, including the Office of Consumer uh, Advocate, um, that then we might be able to go do that performance audit. And you, we may come back and find out we can do one or the other, but not both or uh, whatever that is. Uh, would that, would that, you think that gets us where we want to be, uh, Chuck? Yes. Eric, Thanks. does that sound reasonable to you? He says, okay, any other members, anything else on that? So we've got, there's, there's one, uh, on the, you, on the, on the, I'm back to the department of health. We talked to them. We did not hear back from the chairman about doing that, or we did, and they're not going to. Mr. Chairman, are you referring to the telehealth topics? The that telehealth you and the telehealth and the title 25 hearings. So with we asked them about telehealth projects at a broader level. Um, you know, they identified the number one issue as being broad, broadband connectivity, but they said labor's looking at that. The broadband task force is looking at that yeah. audits probably, it would be redundant. So two other things they suggested related to telehealth would be this um, Wyoming telehealth cybersecurity and looking at, you know, the hospital takeover in Gillette, whether there are issues whether there's measures in place for local communities to make sure they have cybersecurity and then ways, whether if it's the Department of Health through their Office of Privacy, Security and Contracts could assist other in entities. It sounds like ETS might be also in that role, looking at ways that perhaps the state could assist smaller entities with these issues. The second one they identified as being a problem, which um, judici joint judiciary Judiciary Committee is looking at right now, I believe, um, and then Joint Labor has also kind of looked at the issue. It'd be these Title 25 um, hearings. There's transportation costs. Judiciary is looking at who pays for what. There's like a 70, 72 hour period, I believe, and then the it, the costs burden switches to other entities. Um, the Joint Labor Chairman suggested that. I think during COVID and maybe even before, Laramie County had been doing a lot of these virtually and whether the, um, what the cost savings might look like if all of these went virtually to where you're not transporting people from Evanston or to various places. Yeah, I, you know, I, I just met with my, uh, with uh, three of my judges, well, one, one justice and a district court judge and a county court judge in my <laughs> county. And we were talking about this very issue and not just in title 25s, but all kinds of appearances before these judges uh, you know, bond, you know, uh, bond city, initial appearances, different things like that. And uh, they've all become, because they were forced to do it now, it seems like that there's a significant number before thought all that stuff had to be in person. Now that they were forced to do it, it seems to me there's a growing acceptance that they can do that effectively remotely. And so, you know, that that is an issue that if this committee is interested that we probably could take a look at if if that's a subset that is not going to be uh, looked at by either judiciary or uh, or labor. Representative Pelkey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I I believe judiciary is looking at at a kind of a broad approach to uh, the uh, remote appearances. Um, you know, we uh, we're hoping that post-COVID that a number of the courts adopt uh, those remote appearances. I personally appeared in courts uh, in Carbon, Albany, and Laramie counties over the span of an hour and a half, which obviously would have been impossible in the old days. 
Uh, and we've been discussing that in June. Okay, President Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just as a member of judiciary, I mean, we had a bill that was approved in our last meeting to uh, put into statute the email uh, submissions that uh, were suddenly allowed during COVID. And now they're saying post COVID, they might remove that. And uh, we were gonna, we, we approved the bill to put that into statute to, to mandate that. And, um, and there is a Title 25 bill coming to judiciary in the last meeting that is a pretty big change. Um, but in terms of remote appearances, I don't recall that where we talked about, I mean, we talked about, uh, but there's no bill or policy change I, I recall, but I think we talked generally about how the courts were working during COVID, but um, anyway, thanks. Okay, thank you then. I think the other the other thing then too is uh, is one of the things that the committee said we're going to do is we're going to follow up on uh, on these audit reports and the corrective actions. We're going to start doing that on a regular basis, and so you know we uh, you know those uh, uh, the letters from from audit is I understand it, the letters from audit have to go out uh, what is this, uh, this month. I think those letters from audit have to go out this month. And if they haven't heard back by November, then then the second letter goes out by the end of November. So, you know, I think uh, you, uh, we may want to touch base and just see uh, where they're at with those things and see what kind of, if we're going to follow help follow up on those things for Department of Audit, we ought to check with them and see what their, what their list is now. We, we kind of talked about their list at the end of, uh, or, you know, I guess it'd be end of last year, but we got to kind of see where they're at uh, in time for that and see what kind of effort we're going to, we may have to make in that regard to follow up on that and, and, and make sure that people are trying to uh, be transparent and safeguard public assets as well. So, uh, Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Ch uh, Chairman, President Perkins. Uh, the other thing we could do is bring in the Department of Ag, you know, I, they had that August 3rd audit that uh, the August 3rd letter that was sent out in late September. So, I mean, they haven't responded to it yet, but we could also get some feedback on how the part, they felt the department audit, how it was interacting with them as well. So. I, think that's a, I think that's an excellent suggestion. Yeah. And, uh, then I see Abby's already sent out the Ferrara reports. I see you've already sent those out, so we've got those. Anything else? Any any other particular committee action today? Mr. Chairman. Yes, Abigail. I do need to clarify. Did you want us to go ahead and scope a potential project for the virtual hearings for Title Twenty Five? I think the answer is no. I think okay. the answer is, I think that it sounds like judiciary's got that. Okay. Senator James. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So are we only going to stay an interim committee or are we going to actually try and become a, a real committee? And, uh, uh, you know, do stuff during session as well. Well, what, so as I understood that, um, so if you go back to the memo that, that Abby, the, the memo that y'all sent out to us in that regard was that we were not a standing committee and that if, if, uh, is there, you know, the, so the question is, is, is what interest does the, the committee members have? And you want to have discussion about that? What was I understood the memo, Abby, was that we would have to, you'd have to change both the statute and the rules in order for us to do that and, and divide into, uh, we'd have to divide into a Senate, a Senate section and a, and a House section in order to operate during when, when the when the legislature's in session is that do I, did i understand your memo correctly 
Yeah, Mr. Chairman, to meet during session, you would have to be a standing committee formed by each chamber. Um, and then that statute would apply to where the standing committee can meet jointly. Um, your audit functions are still under the management audit statute. So I guess conceivably you could have both and be for different purposes, but it'd probably be cleaner to change the statute as well. Yeah, if you're gonna do that. So um, if you wanna have a discussion about that, I mean, should the, should I, so the, the first item of business, I guess, that Senator James brings up is should the uh, should the management audit committee uh, become a standing committee uh, so that it it has the opportunity to meet during uh, session and and uh, consider bills and when we do that I mean keep in mind that it the Senate the Senate it, it split into subcommittees or or separate committees uh, and and then somehow that you have to change the statute so that the management audit committee is then uh, really a joint committee for the interim I, this is the way I understood the memo Abby um, and so it, it changes that it, it's it makes an interesting uh, concept about how you would do that uh, but I don't there's no nothing that says it can't be done so Mr. Chairman if I might if you do become a standing committee that then becomes a joint interim committee there is that you're more under for the interim under management council directives in terms of the interim topics which Currently, your audit functions are operate outside of that management council. Um, they don't approve your audits. They approve the staff resources and stuff, but they don't approve the audits. Whereas, the interim topics generally go through management council. So it's kind of like we're the OCA of the PSC for the the, the legislature. Huh? We're uh, under we're part of the division, but we're we're separate. Uh, you know, and that's <clears throat> so. I don't know how you, you know, it's inter it's, it's difficult how you straddle those two horses at the same time, but that's a discussion. It's not, you know, let's have that discussion. <laughs> Representative Gray. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm, I've always been pretty passionate about this, that we should be able to meet during session. I mean, I, I take that bill we worked on last time. I mean, that was a, off an audit from 2016. That bill was, it was amazing. And minerals just, dispatched with it in, you know, 15 minutes. And um, it was a two, three vote, but it was just really disappointing. And, and I think, I think we should be able to, to meet during session. And um, so I'm, I, 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 I think it's, we're the only standing committee in statute that doesn't meet during session. So I think someone needs to explain why, why not? Why, why wouldn't we meet during session? So well, then we're not a standing committee. I think that's the thing. We're a statutory committee. But go ahead, Representative Barlow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So if we were to convert to a, a, a standing committee in the traditional sense, um, the membership would be five and nine, which is not what it is now. Um, we would have, you know, other, other um, we have a, a different budget level. We'd have different things. And it also would require us to meet some, sometimes. It also doesn't, um, as the as the president will know, as a presiding officer, doesn't mean you get bills assigned to you just because you're a standing committee, or even the bills that you sponsored. Um, so there, there's some intricacies in there that really do change the the nature of this committee, um, and some of the independence you lose, i.e., establishing what your audit function is, and those things are things to keep in mind in that in that process. If you go and ask. Uh, the legislature to to give you more authority or give you broader discretion does that would they also cut say oh by the way we're going to take care take away some of your other latitude such as audit function so i just throw that out there as consideration thank you mr chairman thank you senator bouchard thank you mr chairman I mean, I'm, I get the concerns, but I think also we could probably work through those and maybe even tighten down. I mean, if the legislature would approve uh, a, a more uh, custom committee here, because the problem is we're, we're almost like a hobby committee that we're working on these issues. 
I, I mean, I just don't see us. Uh, I mean, I, historically, I've looked at this committee has, as being a committee that people don't want to be on. And they, they get on here and they, they're disappointed because we, they can't get anything done. So I think we have to decide, do we want to change that, uh, change the function of this committee and maybe be it more of a committee that really does things all throughout the year? Or do we, do we just stay and throw ideas up in the air and some of them stick, some of them don't? I think most of them don't. I mean, there's just kind of a will not to uh, dig deeper. So I'm, I'm for the idea of make, making this a real management audit committee that works full time. What, what is it that you think would, it, when you say a real management audit committee, I don't know what that means. So you have to help us understand when you say a real management audit committee, what does that mean? What you have to keep in mind is that, that the, the point of the management audit committee and reason it's set up in statute is it's supposed to be independent so that it's not under the control of management council. So that you can look at indep you can look independently. We have we we don't have to we 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 have the ability to look at things that we want to look at. And if you if you start to change that, you know what 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 does that what does that do to the committee? And so when you say a, a real, I mean the fact that you don't work during the legislature is that when you say is that what makes us not a real management audit committee because we don't meet during session or you have to elaborate because I don't know what that means. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, I, I think that you, uh, you, you very well know that I uh, ran legislation for a legislative audit committee and that committee was very direct in what it would do. I mean, so we've just never really looked at that, at that whole idea of bringing that, those ideas into this committee and moving well, forward. But I think what you were talking about there was did you want, I mean, you, you, you know, you, you went back and you looked at the, the memo and, and uh, the division of audit, whether it's the auditor, I mean, there was, the, there was at least one state that had the Department of Audit or essentially the audit function was under the legislature. It was the legislative branch that did the audit. And, not, you know, that was, that, was, that, was, that was in large part what you were kind of looking at in your bill was you wanted to have the audit function under the legislature, if I remember right. Is that right? Uh, Mr. Chairman, well, I, I don't think I want to audit, just uh, widely audit. I think that the, this, this committee should have that ability to audit what it chooses. So I see the dilemma of being under management audit. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, there's a complexity here that <laughs> we may not get past, but uh, I think there's even things that could happen during session where if we were running a, a bill, we would have the time to bring in, I mean, this during session is when everybody's there. I mean, everybody's prepared different agencies. Um, whereas I don't think uh, it's just the same. I mean, anyway, I, I think if we do this committee and, and the way that kind of what I had envisioned and you, you yourself, Mr. Chairman, said that there were some good ideas there. And I would just like to see some of those good ideas brought forward in this committee and make this committee um, a full-time committee. So it can do, work during the year and, and bring bills to do the same. Thank you. Uh, Representative Pelkey. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I believe we're at the point now where somebody either has to uh, put forth a motion or we can move on to other topics. Okay, thank you. Representative Gray. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would bring a motion and to maintain the Management Audit Committee as a statutorily, statutorily created joint committee. I don't think you need to change the statute at all. And we draft a rule change allowing us to meet during session separately. So you have the statute which says that during the interim we're meeting jointly and we can maintain the membership. It's still an odd number. And then we bring a rule change that says that during session, we can be assigned bills and meet separately. 
Seven and five, it's still an odd number. I, I, I'm i not understanding. You might need to put in a word, a line in the statute that we can meet separately in the session. I don't think you do need to. I mean, it just, I don't think we need to mess with the independence. We just need to change the rule that we can meet separately during session and assign bills to us. That, that's it. It's a rule change. And that's my motion. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the Mr. Vice Chair, you had your hand up. Would you? No. Okay. Senator Grew. Well, just to, well, I guess we'll wait for we're a second. We're in need of a second, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. We're in need of a second. Senator Bouchard has a second. So we're on, now we're on discussion. Senator Grew. Uh, yeah. Question for the bringer of the motion. I take it this rule change that you're speaking of has to be at the start as the start of the session by the entire body is that what is that what yeah because we can't make rules so we have to do something in the in the session or do you have something different in mind i'm trying to figure out sorry why well, that's that's the way i took the motion was that we would draft a rule change that would go in that would be submitted uh for the, when the adoption of the rules when the 66 has its first when we adopt those rules at the beginning of the session that's that's why i took your motion representative gray is that what you meant yeah, joint rule change. It would have to be a joint. Yeah. That's why I took it. Okay. Okay, so we're we're on the motion. Um, question. Ready for the question? All those in favor, raise your hand. So we got one, two, three, four. I'm counting four. Are those opposed? I count one, two, one, two, three, four, five opposed, and the chair would the chair would have voted aye. So uh, that still fails. So okay, what else? What else? All right, there be nothing else. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay, we got a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor, raise your hand. Thank you. Motion passes. Those opposed? No, we're not. So, Abby, uh, Carla, Jonathan, Clarissa, you guys, thank you very much for that. Uh, um, we've, you know, at, we've done, you know, it's amazing. That's, you, you think about, you think about, you know, I'll just reflect on, on some things. Uh, I think I think we've done some some actually interesting, really interesting work this year, and, I, and we're not done yet. And uh, um, you know, we had we had uh, six or seven department heads in there today, explaining about their answers to their performance audits. Um, we are about ready to go out and to invite. Uh, special districts and other political, some other political subdivisions are gonna send 10 letters out asking for explanations where they refuse to respond to the Department of Audit or their, their response has been wholly insufficient. We're gonna invite them and ultimately we're looking about bringing, using subpoena power to bring them if they won't come. Um, you know, folks, I don't, I don't think that management committee's done that before. Uh, we have, we've changed uh, in the last two years, you know, we've cut the moors that, that created a lot of, of angst in the management audit committee, which is where you would decide what it is you wanted to do. And then you had to sit off to the side and not ever make any mid course correction while the audit staff went out and did their, their, their uh, audit. And, and that's been changed. The fact that we untethered from the yellow book so that we could do this. I mean, we have, we have, taken off we have we've made significant changes this committee in the last in this session in this uh, legislature um that are going to have long-lasting effects and uh we're struggling you know i i anticipate we would struggle to find our way a little bit but uh we've done some things and are, are working in towards some transparency and accountability that hasn't been here before and so you know i just you know i it's not where I want, I don't think any of us think this committee where is where we want it to be yet. But I think that we've, we've certainly changed the tenor of it and we're changed direction a little bit 
but I think we're, uh, you know, I think we're exercising, uh, trying to exercise the oversight function of the legislature in a way that it's not being exercised by other committees. And, and so I, you know, I, I encourage you to think about that and think about what it is we can do and what we should do next. I will give that some thought. I'll make that some discussion and, and we'll continue to work on this. And we may even have a few, a few extra ideas when we come back and I meet in our final in our final meeting of the year. So with that, thank you for your time and attendance today. And we'll, uh, we'll talk to you all again soon. Thank you, Abby. And, and thanks staff. Appreciate it. Thank Bye. You. Goodbye. Thank you. And adjourned, I guess that's the word.